welcome everybody to the opening of the Hitchin and Go Mathematics Laboratory. Um, so my name is Steve Bradlow. You can actually see it on the screen there, I guess. Um, so um, I was lucky enough to be a member of both of the laboratories that preceded this one. Um, and as I'm sure all of you are, I'm very much looking forward to this new version. Uh, for those of you who didn't know that mathematics laboratories were a thing, uh, let me point out that uh, if you look up in the dictionary, you'll find that a laboratory is defined as a place equipped for scientific experiments, research and teaching, or another definition I saw said it's a place providing opportunities for experimentation, observation and practice in a field of study. And so I don't know if this was the uh, intention when these IC mat mathematics laboratories were set up, but I think they <laughs> interpret the use of the term as a reminder to us that the full range of these laboratory activities, including experimentation and observation, are all essential for mathematics discovery and progress. Uh, in case you haven't read your email or looked at the website, uh, the program for today includes three 40-minute talks about the scientific agenda of the laboratory, um, and each will be followed by time for questions and a short break. Um, but before we get to that scientific part of the program, the coordinator of the laboratory, Oscar Garcia Prada, uh, has some words of welcome for you. So Oscar, over to you. Okay, thank you. Give me just one second to share a screen with you. And, um, yes, sir. Well, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. And um, uh, a special thanks to Steve Bradlow for having accepted to be uh, the chair of this uh, session. And um, I am uh, in my screen. Um, you can see the you can see the web page of the lab where you can actually find. Uh, information. So this is uh, Nigel and this is Chow. And um, the, this, uh, let me just put uh, this uh, lab in a, in a context, in a larger context. This is part of a program that we have uh, at our institute, the uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Madrid, the ICMAT. And so we have currently four laboratories uh, attached to these people here. Uh, Ian Agel, uh, Charles Pfefferman, Ignacio Sirak, and then Nigel Hitching and Go Bao Chao. And, um, and so uh, uh, if I look like sometimes I'm missing uh, things, I am uh, still admitting people in the room. So... Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So just um, to um, very briefly, um, th this is definitely a, a space uh, for experimentation and all the things, wonderful things that, that uh, Steve has said. And just let me mention that uh, this lab, uh, the idea is that it will be active until the end of uh, 2023. And uh, so as we can, you can see here is the, uh, the uh, main goal is to foster interaction and collaboration in the following research areas. We have selected a number of areas there, are, you know, there are other things we may explore and they are already quite broad. The Hitchin system, Langland's duality and mirror symmetry, then Higgs bundles, character varieties and higher technical spaces. And their uh, gauge theory, moduli spaces, and geometric structures are pretty broad, as you can see, right? So you can you can uh, find information there. We have uh, some sections on events like this uh, event and job opportunities and so on. And so uh, we hope that very soon we will be able to um, to have uh, events where we can really meet, you know, and make all the experiments here in Madrid. And um, and um, so you can see in the events page uh, this event, but also I just want to call your attention uh, so that we still have to, uh, to plan things uh, once the pandemic situation is clearer. But one thing that uh, to look ahead is the main activity of the lab, 
which is a, a special three month activity that we plan to have in the spring of 2023. So this is still quite some time to go. And so hopefully uh, uh, things will be uh, good by then. And hopefully, I mean, we all hope that it will be good uh, sooner. So you can look at the web page. And uh, so with uh, no more delay, I just hand the word to, uh, to Steve to uh, introduce uh, the speakers of today. So thank you very much for joining and uh, everyone be welcome. Okay, um, so um, <clears throat> our first talk is by Nigel Hitchin, one of the two co-chairmen of this laboratory. Uh, I think it's uh, no exaggeration to say that uh, in large parts of geometry, Nigel's work has been a major source of inspiration for at least 30 years now. So it's uh, really a great honor to introduce him. Um, Nigel will talk on mirror symmetry and geometric structures. Okay, Nigel, um, over to you. Uh, you're going to share your screen. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, you don't have to. <laughs> oh, well, so, okay, I don't have to. Okay. No, I mean, it's up, uh, that, that was your intention, I thought. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Okay, so let me. Uh, let me begin by saying um, I'm very happy to be involved with this, uh, this new lab. Um, like the other ones before it, not only is it uh, an opportunity for the exchange and support of young people, but it's also a forum. It's like a focal point for mathematicians with common interests. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, well, in a way, it's I should really refer to one of the, the remits that we just saw of the, uh, of the lab, which was gauge theory, modernized spaces and geometric structures. So, uh, so geometric structures is there in my title, but it may be uh, useful to actually recall how I really got involved with, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so I'm not, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, Okay, can you see all that? Yes? Yep. Okay. So how I got involved in, uh, in Higgs bundles in the first place. So, um, and it's really uh, through the geometric structure on the modernized space, namely the hypercalar metric. So in the early 1980s, uh, I was very interested in magnetic monopoles on R3, uh, which are gauge theoretic equations. And then, um, through uh, a formal application of the hypercalar quotient construction, uh, it appeared that there was a hypercalar metric on, this mod on all these moduli spaces. And I spent uh, some time looking into this. And then it, it occurred to me that it was a very similar situation in two dimensions, which uh, yielded eventually, um, or maybe quite quickly, uh, the notion of Higgs bundles on, on a curve. So it's worthwhile to kind of uh, compare these two. So I should say that there is a difference. So for, well, first of all, hypercalar metrics, what are hypercalar metrics? Well, this is what it is. It's a very special kind of metric. Um, we have complex structures, I, J, and K, which behave like quaternions. And there's a metric uh, which makes each of these scalar. So we have symplectic forms, scalar forms, omega one, omega two, and omega three corresponding to I, J, and K. So when I was a research student, nobody knew of any examples of these. That's the honest truth. And then gradually in the 1970s, one or two uh, examples came up, largely through um, uh, general relativity. But anyway, in the 80s, it was clear that somehow the modernized space of monopoles, and also, if you looked at it the right way, instantons, these had hypercalar metrics. But uh, what is the difference? What are the different aspects between Higgs bundles and uh, monopoles? Well, one is that actually we can solve the monopole equations explicitly. Well, it depends what you mean, but at least using spectral curve methods or NARMS equations methods, we know how to solve the actual Bogomoly equations. And that gives us some extra input into the study of the hypercalar metric. Higgs bundles may have spectral curves, but they, they appear in a different fashion. They don't actually help to 
solve the Higgs bundle equations, which are boundary conditions of a compact surface are much more complicated. Um, but what they do do is to give us a, a structure, a lot of structure on the, on the moduli space. The other difference is that uh, rotations in R3 take any one of these complex structures to any other. We don't have this SO3 action for Higgs bundles, we only have a circle action. And uh, so these are, so in, in some respects, we know much more about magnetic monopoles and uh, far less about, uh, about Higgs bundles in terms of the metric structure. Uh, on the other hand, you only have to change the monopole equation slightly to uh, change those to hyperbolic space, where the equations are actually, uh, again, easy to solve, possibly easier to solve than the Euclidean ones. They're, they're kind of algebraic solutions, but we really don't know a good structure, metric structure or associated structure on the moduli space of hyperbolic monopoles. So, there are, these, are equa these are issues which you know, can still be part of the lab's activities, but it's not what I'm going to talk about today. So just, I want to just bear in mind that uh, there are all sorts of issues about possible metric structures or other types of geometric structures and other types of moduli spaces. And uh, these also ought to form some kind of uh, existence within this, within this lab. So, in fact, you know, I hope to be able to later on during the two years to maybe to introduce some of these ideas. So, for the moment, let me go into uh, the issue that uh, concerns me at the moment, uh, the notion of mirror symmetry. So, this is something uh, which appears in uh, the study of kalaba yau manifolds. So, why, why is it relevant here? Because a hyperkähler manifold is automatically a Calabi-Yau manifold. So uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds are supposed to occur in mirror pairs and uh, the mirror symmetry is supposed to interchange uh, aspects of the complex geometry of one, the so-called B model, with aspects of the symplectic geometry of the other, of the mirror, which is called the A model. Now, there are various ways in which this is uh, attempted to be realized. Um, and one of them, the most geometrical one, probably, is the notion of the SYZ mirror symmetry, strominger yau zaslow mirror symmetry, which requires a, a special Lagrangian vibration by tori. So, and in this picture, the, the mirror of a Calabi yau manifold with a torus vibration uh, should be the dual torus, namely the, you replace the torus by its dual, the moduli space of flat uh, line bundles on it, uh, which is another, another torus. So that's the, that's the notion of uh, SYZ mirror symmetry. And uh, in the early days of SYZ, um, Arinkin and Polishchuk kind of outlined how, how this kind of uh, symmetry would work in the notion of a, a in the kind of Fukaya uh, setting. So this is the, the aspect which is kind of most relevant to, to my talk today. So if we have a, a, a so they're talking about not the hypercalous situation, but the kalabi situation with the assumption that you're starting with a, a, a special uh, Lagrangian vibration by tori, which I've written here as M, uh, of, uh, base B. So the mirror is, is now the dual torus, each fiber is replaced by its dual torus. And um, one ass assumes that there's some kind of Poincaré line bundle over the, uh, over the uh, fiber product. And then if you have a Lagrangian submanifold of M, then the Fourier Mokai so there's a, a C infinity version of Fourier Mokai, which they uh, introduce, which produces a vector bundle over the mirror. So in the, in the context of uh, the Fukai category, you can think of the, the torus fiber together with a line bundle as being, uh, so this is a Lagrangian, one Lagrangian with a flat line bundle on it. And now we have a look at the intersection with another Lagrangian submanifold U 
and then the, if you like, the Hons from one to the other are given by the direct sum of sections of the line bundle over the intersection. So that naive point of view is basically a, a kind of a Fourier Mokai type, uh, type construction. So, so this was this was a kind of C infinity version, which works up to a point when you use uh, some so-called uh, semi-flat uh, metrics. So it was an indication, if you like, about how uh, mirror symmetry should operate on Lagrangian manifolds. So let me move now to um, to Higgs bundles themselves, which is a situation where, in fact, we have a ready-made uh, Lagrangian vibration. And so it's a perfect uh, test bed, a perfect place to experiment to see whether mirror symmetry actually works. So here's a definition of Higgs bundle. We have setting up notation because I'm sure most people watching this know what, uh, what we've got here. So we have Riemann surface, an algebraic curve sigma, a holomorphic bundle V, and a holomorphic section, the Higgs field of the endomorphisms of V twisted with the canonical bundle. If we impose a stability condition on this, then we get a well-defined moduli space, but also we get an existence theorem for some gauge theoretic equations, and it's the moduli space of solutions of these equations, which yields a hypercalar metric. So the key feature to define the Lagrangian vibration is the spectral curve. So here we take the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, and this defines a, a curve, an n-fold covering, if the vector bundle is of rank n. And if we take a line bundle on L, L on S and take its direct image, we get a vector bundle on sigma. If we take this X here, which is basically a section of the pullback of the canonical bundle to S, we take the direct image of that, then we get the Higgs field. So this way we get a, in the, the moduli space gives us a, a vibration, the base B is the equation of the spectral curve, the coefficients. Each of these coefficients is a holomorphic section of some powers of the canonical bundle. So this base is here, just the vector space. And the fiber, the generic fiber, is the Jacobian of the spectral curve. So we fix the spectral curve, and we vary the line bundle, so we have the line bundle in the Jacobian, or some component of the Jacobian, and uh, then we get our, our Higgs bundle. So this, uh, this is now a holomorphic vibration, but if you look at it in the right way, using the right uh, complex structures, it's an example of a special Lagrangian vibration, which means that it's, everything is set up here naturally for uh, applying SYZ mirror symmetry. So the situation really is that if, so complex structure I, I'm going to call the complex structure of uh, Higgs fields, uh, in this case, the two symplectic forms for the other complex structures form a holomorphic symplectic form. And then a holomorphic Lagrangian is one which is complex with respect to I and Lagrangian with respect to omega 2 and omega 3. And that, in the physicist's uh, terminology, is called a BAA brain. B for the complex structure, A and A for the two symplectic structures. So. It's Lagrangian with respect to two of those structures and complex with respect to the other. And then the mirror is supposed to be a BBB brain, which is something which is holomorphic with respect to all the complex structures. So this is a, a hyperholomorphic bundle. And it's supposed to be supported on a hypercalar submanifold. So typically, uh, it's very difficult to find hypercalar submanifolds. So typically, uh, this thing works, or is supposed to work, when the, the hypercalar submanifold is actually the, the full uh, mirror, the full mirror. And the, we have a good no notion of the mirror, but I'm, at the moment I'm just talking about the general linear group. And in this case, the, uh, the, the Jacobian is uh, dual to itself. And so the mirror is actually isomorphic to the original moduli space itself in general. We have to talk about uh, we have to talk about uh, other other well, the other symmetry. So uh, I'm I'm, ref I'm I'm not going to talk about other groups in, in, this, in this setting. 
So I think these, this idea sort of uh, entered the theory of uh, Higgs bundles um, a few years ago. And the first uh, examples to try and make this work were where you took a, uh, the Higgs bundles corresponding to a character variety for a real form of GLNC. So this, uh, this, is, uh, this gives you a, a sub-manifold, sub which is a complex Lagrangian in complex structure I, and uh, real uh, in the uh, complex structure J. And this, this is an example of a BAA brain. And there's some, some very interesting conjectures. So in, a, in one or two cases, one can see how it, it would work. Uh, there are some very good conjectures, but uh, I think I'm not really up to date on this issue, but I think it's uh, uh, problems occur because of singularities in the, in the mirror moduli space. Uh, but hopefully, perhaps, uh, this, this work will be taken up again in the next two years, and maybe we'll make some progress within, within the lab. I mean, instead of this, I want to talk about something which uh, I've been looking at recently with Thomas Hausel, who's uh, uh, an associate member of the lab, and this involves upward flows. So we have a paper here. So I, I joined uh, Tamas's project here, and uh, it's, this is a, a project which started out wanting to look at uh, one thing, but uh, has uh, moved on to all sorts of other aspects. So I think, I think one, one can consider this as an example of uh, a particular problem, which I'll explain in more detail in a minute, but it's, it's also a, a kind of window into, into Higgs bundles. I think as we've got further into it, uh, not only have uh, new aspects of Higgs bundles been revealed to us, but also I think neglected areas. So uh, I think you, uh, you'll see in, in a few slides what I mean by this. So uh, I think this is typical perhaps of a research project. You start out trying to do one thing, and it's what you learn on the way, which is perhaps the most, uh, the most useful aspect of that research. So what are these upward flows? Well, we have this C star action, uh, rescaling the, the Higgs field. And if we look at a fixed point of this, <clears throat> then this means that the, there is an automorphism of the vector bundle of V0, which acts on the Higgs field phi zero as uh, scalar multiplication. So in that case, the Higgs field has to be, has to be nilpotent. So we have a, a fixed point, this is on the, the nilpotent cone, and uh, another Higgs bundle, V phi, is said to be in the upward flow of this point if the limit of V lambda phi as lambda tends to zero is equal to V zero phi zero. So it's the the downward limit is all the, all the Higgs bundles whose downward limit, if you like, is this uh, V0 phi zero. Uh, and so what we know uh, about this is that uh, there's a, a BB decomposition of this uh, moduli space corresponding to the C star action. Uh, this is not uh, compact, but uh, Tamas produced in this paper a uh, what's called a, a version of it for semi-projective varieties, which works very well in this situation. And so what we learned from that is that actually the, uh, the upward flow of a fixed point is a copy of Cn. And not only that, but it's Lagrangian. So n is here half the dimension of, of m, half the complex dimension of m. So, uh, so these upward flows as, uh, complex manifolds are quite simple, they're just affine spaces, but it's the way that they sit into the moduli space, which is the, the important aspect. So here's an example. Suppose we take the, uh, the canonical Higgs bundle. So this is the one which is, starts off uh, the canonical section or the so-called Hitching component. Then here is our nilpotent uh, Higgs field, is the V0, phi zero is this. Uh, the upward flow from this is uh, is where we well it's the it's actually the section the so-called Hitchin section. So, so we see it here as just the upward flow from from this this fixed point, and of course this is uh, this is Lagrangian, 
Uh, it's also, in fact, uh, as we know, uh, the higher one of the higher Teichmann spaces. So it it's also corresponds to to a real form. So that's one one extreme. Uh, the other extreme is going way down to the bottom and looking at a stable bundle. So suppose we start with a, a stable bundle with zero Higgs field. Then what is the upward flow from this? Well, we take the same vector bundle V0 and look at all the Higgs fields, look at all the Higgs fields. Then uh, as lambda tends to zero, of course, the Higgs field tends to, tends to zero. So V0 has to be stable here. And another way of seeing this is to say that this is the, the cotangent space of a point in the moduli space N of stable bundles uh, sitting inside M. So if this is another uh, copy of CN sitting inside M. These are two extreme examples. Uh, so what are the challenges? So what we want to do is to try and um, see whether Fourier Mukai, or sorry, where the mirror symmetry according to Strominger Yao Zesla really works in this situation. This at least is perhaps my, my aim as far as this uh, geometric structures is concerned. So there are lots of issues. I mean, well, the most immediate one is, is this, is the transform really a vector bundle? I mean, we're, when we talk about a torus vibration, we're of course just talking about the generic fiber those fibers become singular in very complicated ways. So the naive idea is not, um, does not necessarily hold over the singular fibers, or at least in principle it doesn't. Uh, but suppose there's a vector bundle, then what can we say about its rank? Uh, what about its topological properties, germ classes and so forth? And then also, well, what is its structure? What is its internal structure? Um, if we, we want to understand something about this, uh, how does it relate to the initial point that we, uh, we actually started from, the, the point at which we take the upward flow? And finally, is there really a hyperholomorphic connection on this, uh, this bundle? So I should say that a hyperholomorphic bundle uh, essentially is, uh, has, has a connection, a connection whose curvature is of type 1, 1, with respect to all these complex structures. So the way I've phrased that suggests that I have a certain amount of skepticism uh, about the last uh, point, but that makes it a challenge. So uh, let's look first of all at the rank here. So, um, so here, this is where it's important to introduce this notion of very stable. So this was introduced by Lomont for stable bundles uh, a long time ago. So he said that a, a stable vector bundle is very stable if it has no nilpotent Higgs fields. So the adaptation of this to Higgs bundles is that we say that a, a fixed point V0 phi zero, fixed point of the C star action is very stable if it's the only point of intersection of U with the nilpotent cone. So this is a nilpotent Higgs bundle uh, but if the upward flow doesn't meet the nilpotent cone again, then we say that this is very stable. Unfortunately, there's a nice way of saying that. It's the equivalent to saying that the upward flow is a closed subvariety. So what we can do now is restrict the vibration over the base to, to U, and we get a, a proper map uh, between uh, uh, vector spaces here of the same dimension. And now <clears throat> at least we can, we can think of the rank now in terms of the, the degree of this map. But this, the question of looking at the rank is one which links together two different points of view. So here's, here's a diagram which uh, uh, schematically I think shows what happens. So here is the, so this black circle here is supposed to be uh, a component of the fixed point set the C star action. So we take a point on it, and then this is the upward flow, and it intersects a generic fiber in uh, a certain number of points. Suppose it intersects in a finite number of points, then if we're going to do a fourier mokai transform of this, then it's the, uh, the transform is uh, a vector bundle, whose, uh, which it, it corresponds to the direct sum, 
of the line bundle on the fiber at these, so these points. So the rank of that vector bundle is the number of points. So it's the number of points of intersection of U with a generic fiber of the vibration. So that's one way of thinking about the rank of this. On the other hand, if you go down to the other end of it, geometrically, this upward flow meets the downward flow from this point from this point here. So, so the downward flow from this fixed point set here fills out a component, a compact component of the nilpotent cur cur cone. And so when you get down to this point, so although this intersects it transversely, uh, the, this has a, a multiplicity. This component of the nilpotent cone has a multiplicity. If you like, you can think of it the union of all of these components with their appropriate multiplicities is homologous to a generic fiber. So the, the rank is also given by the multiplicity of this, uh, of this component. So here we have a, a geometric way of linking together two notions of, uh, of rank. There is in fact uh, a better way of uh, uh, more algebraic way and this is something which Tamas introduced, uh, which we call the uh, the virtual equivariant character, really. But so if V is a, a vector space with a C star action, then and the character here is the, the sum of this expression over the positive weights of the of the action. So V lambda, V subscript lambda, is the subspace on which uh, V C star action has weight lambda. So the, uh, if we look at the upward flow from a point M, then the tangent space to the upward flow is a C star invariant uh, subspace. And the equivariant multiplicity is given by the ratio of the character for this and the character for the base. So for example, uh, in the case of the, uh, the first example I gave you of the canonical bundle and the section, then this is, uh, th this is now one because the, it's, we have an, the projection gives you an isomorphism between U and, U and B. So if, uh, if V phi is very stable, then the rank is actually the value of this, uh, this in fact, polynomial at T equals one. So that's the, uh, that's the issue of, uh, of rank. So in, in, uh, in asking the question about what is the rank of this mirror, this vector bundle, one encounters uh, ways in which you can relate the multiplicity of the components of the nilpotent cone to other geometric entities. So now what about this structure? What about the internal structure of this uh, vector bundle? Now here I want to go, not as we've been largely looking at the top of the uh, nilpotent cone. I want to look at the bottom. I want to look at stable bundles. And, uh, and to recall what it is we know and what it is we don't know. So if we want to, we want to do some experimentation. Right? We want to understand uh, the structure of this, uh, uh, this vector bundle when we take an upward flow, which is just the, the space of uh, Higgs fields on a given stable uh, vector bundle. So we need to understand the moduli space of stable bundles. And well, we have these classical results from the 1960s, I guess, that uh, in genus two of uh, even degree, then the moduli space of stable bundles is P3, or semi-stable bundles is P3. For genus two in odd degree, it's the intersection of two quadrics in P5. And when genus uh, three and non-hyperelliptic, uh, an even degree, then it's this uh, famous quartic hypersurface in P7, the Cobalt quartic. So, um, well, what we, what do we want to look at is really part of uh, what's called, uh, well, what became famous, if you like, the completely integrable system associated to this picture. So if we think of the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of stable bundles as a, as a, in fact, a big open set inside the moduli space of Higgs bundles, and we have this uh, map here, this proper map onto, okay, we're in rank two, 
So the base is now the fixed determinant. So the base is now the space of quadratic differentials. So 3G minus three dimensional vector space for a 3G minus uh, 6G minus six dimensional uh, manifold M. And the, so the upward flow from a stable bundle is the cotangent space. And so if we want to consider the, uh, the map, uh, the projection map from U, which is now the cotangent space to the, the base, then we're really looking at uh, this completely integral system restricted to uh, one of these cotangent uh, fibers. So what is it? In this case, the, the map is just if you like trace of phi squared or the determinant of phi. It's, uh, it's a, a quadratic map between C3G minus three to one C3G minus three to another CG minus three. So, uh, so what is this? And so now this is where we encounter, you know, a lacuna, if you like. Well, not in this case, actually. Well, it depends. So as far as I know, there's only been one uh, example of this integral system worked out, at least for a smooth curve. Um, and this was done originally by Van Gehmen and Previato. There's a nice uh, way of doing it, also followed up by Gavensky and uh, Tran Gott Bich. And there's, uh, there's a more recent uh, paper by uh, Loray and, and Hugh. But, but the, so let me just give you the picture. This is what comes, comes here. So, okay, so we have a, we have a hyperelliptic curve given by that, uh, and given by this equation here. Okay, so we have six points in P3, in P2, sorry, six points in P1. We take a double covering branch of those six points. And, um, and the, the integral system, and this is the formula according to Gawensky, this is a very beautiful formula. Uh, it looks like this. So we, have, we think of the cotangent bundle of P3 as being the a set of pairs P, Q. So you think of P as being homogeneous coordinates in P3 and Q as being the, the coordinates in the fiber. So <clears throat> this was the formula for the integral system. This is now a quadratic differential on the hyperelliptic curve. And so what we're interested in here is if you like fixing P, so that's fixing a stable vector bundle and looking at this uh, as a quadratic map from a vector space with uh, coordinates Q1, Q2, Q3 to the three dimensional space of the quadratic differentials. Well, it looks quite complicated. It's a beautiful expression, but it's rather difficult to, to work with. And uh, so we need a, a better way of looking at things. Uh, we need more information on what this integral system fiber by fiber really looks like. Not maybe not more information, but we need some more accessible information. So here's what uh, I, uh, I discovered. In fact, I discovered this. So this is based on a, a paper of Michael Atier in 1955. So um, with, this is before stability and so forth. So he was looking at uh, vector bundles, rank two vector bundles on curves in terms of ruled surfaces. So, which means looking at essentially at the projective bundle, but then uh, our issue involves the uh, endomorphism bundle of these. So it's really a projective general linear problem. In other words, invariant under tensoring V by a line bundle L, the square is, is trivial. So, um, so what he did was to give a, uh, in the odd degree case for genus two, a description of the moduli space as a double cover of P3 branched over six planes. So I have to say that I, I first learned of this um, by reading an account by Simon Donaldson of Michael Atier's work on, uh, on uh, vector bundles. So which is due to appear at some stage in the, in the I think in the notices of the AMS. Anyway, um, so, the, so this is, if you like, a new, a new way, or it's not a new, it's a very old way of looking at rank two bundles over a hyperelliptic curve, genus two, but it's one which actually gives us uh, much better information. So the idea is this, that you, you represent the vector bundle as an extension like this, and then the extension class, uh, well, lies in this space, but this is a two-dimensional space. 
When we take the projective space, so the projective space, the vector bundle of justice depends on the projective class of this. The projective space of a two-dimensional space is canonically isomorphic to the projective space of this dual. Uh, so this is uh, it's defined then by a section of uh, KL, a divising, P plus Q plus R. So you have the hyperelliptic involution giving P1 and the moduli space turns out to be the equivalence class of unordered triples uh, like this. So, so if you look at the image of P, Q and R in P1, this is unordered. This is a point in the third symmetric power, which is P3. And according to this equivalence class, you'll see that uh, this is branched over these six, these six uh, planes. So uh, this is a very uh, more amenable <coughs> description rather than the intersection of two quadrics. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can see very clearly that the, the very stable uh, vector bundles uh, consist of the complement of these, uh, these planes here. So now you can uh, actually do the calculation much easier and you find that there are certain there are coordinates, uh, you can choose coordinates on C3 and C3 here, such that this, this map looks like, uh, like this, x squared, y squared, z squared, very simple. That's for a very stable one. For the a generic, not very stable one, uh, then it looks like this. And you can see now that uh, this has a nilpotent Higgs field because zero, zero, Z goes to zero, zero, zero. So that's, that means that it's, it's nilpotent everywhere. So <clears throat> actually, if you want to, so these are not very stable loci inside the moduli space of stable bundles. These are called wobbly uh, divisors. And there's this recent paper, well, not so recent, this paper of Pal and Pauli, which actually um, describes uh, geometrically um, the structure of, uh, of these things. So actually in genus three, uh, you know, so if we're doing experiments, which is what I've been trying to do, to look at this, uh, this map, then uh, Pauli wrote another paper, a very nice paper about Cobalt's quartic surface. And there's a way in fact, uh, that you can get uh, this, this quadratic map um, in a much more amenable form uh, here. So in the, what he shows is that Given a rank two stable bundle V with trivial determinant, then uh, there exists a unique W whose determinant is a canonical bundle, such that this uh, vector space here has of sections is actually four dimensional. <clears throat> so um, anybody who's worked in four dimensional Riemannian geometry in terms of spinners, tensor product of spinners will know that the there's a, a natural quadratic form. So each of these V and W has a skew symmetric form, one with values in the trivial bundle, one with values in, key, in K. So <clears throat> this four dimensional space has a quadratic form with values in sections of the canonical bundle, which on genus three is a three dimensional space. Not only that, but if you think in terms of <clears throat> self dual two forms and anti self dual two forms, the uh, second exterior power of this four dimensional space has a map to, uh, to this space here, which is also uh, six dimensional, 3G minus three, and is isomorphic to this endomorphism bundle. So the whole thing comes down to <coughs> studying the geometry of a four dimensional space with a quadratic form with values. No, 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 I just need to be um, <laughs> So this is a, a net net of quadrants. So all I'm saying here is that actually um, there's, there's, if you want to ask a specific question, then sometimes the classical models of, uh, uh, of moduli spaces uh, are adapted to different purposes and there may be other ways of looking at things which give you more explicit information. So now uh, let, let me look now at the, just the, the higher rank. Uh, so higher rank, I mean higher up in, in, since we're still in rank two, but higher up in the nilpotent uh, cone, what, are the, what do the upward flows from the, uh, the other fixed points there look like? So these are, this is the typical situation for a nilpotent Higgs field. <clears throat> the V phi is very stable if, it's, if B has simple zeros. And for example, if, uh, if L was 
k to the minus a half, then b will be non-vanishing, and then this will be an isomorphism. Uh, and in general, the the map you can find uh, you can find coordinates such that this map from this c three g minus three to c three g minus three looks looks like this. So so far, everything looks uh, looks rather as if it's uh, standard, uh, but that's not in true in fact the general uh, situation. So one of the things which uh, Thomas and I have been involved with more recently is the uh, the fact that this to look at the the algebra, right? So we have a map, an algebraic map from CN to CN, and the given by say in, in rank two by these uh, quadratic functions, and uh, uh, so there's a there's an algebra given by the, uh, the the vanishing of these these functions. So what it is is that. We could think of it this way: If we take the the Fourier transform, Fourier Mackay transform of this Lagrangian, we take its, we look at the the structure sheath, we take its direct image onto the base, then we lift the base up in terms to the to the canonical section. Then what we're really saying is that we're looking at the mirror, the mirror vector bundle, restricted to the uh, the canonical section, and this this has a, so because we're looking at the direct image of the structure sheath, this is now an algebra. So this is part of the then of the structure of the <coughs> part of the structure of the of the mirror, but only restricted to this particular uh, sub variety. So here I point out that this is the uh, these are the relations in the cohomology of uh, products of complex projective lines. And uh, why do I do that? Because uh, as you, if we look at the, the, the case of GLN and we look at, uh, at the, uh, <clears throat> if we look at fixed points, which look like this, then uh, what you find is that the, uh, actually this algebra is the, the cohomology of a product of, of Grassmannian. So, so there's some, so up at the top, the top of the uh, nilpotent cone, we seem to be getting something which is related to uh, to anyway the geometry of Grassmannians and groups and representations of groups. At the bottom, we're getting sort of uh, some terra incognita, which is uh, uh, trying to understand the integrable system uh, for each co cotangent fiber. Okay, well, let me move on to final, the final part of this, which is <coughs> the question of uh, hyperholomorphic bundles. So a hyperholomorphic bundle is, uh, okay, it's equivalent to a holomorphic bundle on the twister space of M. So any hyperkähler manifold has a corresponding uh, complex manifold called its twister space. And if the bundle is uh, trivial on the real twister line, which is a generic situation, then in fact you get a connection whose curvature is of type one one with respect to all complex structures, and that's what I understand as being a, uh, a hyperholomorphic bundle. Uh, so if we take a type one 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 upward flow, so this means that the uh, so this is in higher higher <coughs> higher rank, then we know what the very stable condition is. It's that uh, product of these BIs, so I don't know whether I had that previously, but you get a chain. Uh, so the fixed point is given by a chain of line bundles. And there's a BI is a, a map from one line bundle to the tensor product of the next one with the canonical bundle. And uh, the <coughs> conditions were very st stable is that the, uh, there should be simple zeros and no multiple, no repeated zeros. So the product should have simple zeros. And then it turns out that the fourier mackay transform, which is our mirror vector bundle, is a, a tensor product of exterior powers of universal bundles corresponding to the points in each of these uh, devices. So these are devices have simple zeros. <clears throat> so fortunately in this case, well fortunately, maybe predictably according to mirror symmetry, uh, these uh, Universal bundles do have hyperholomorphic structures. There is a hyperholomorphic connection on each of these, and hence 
from the, uh, the tensor products of these things. So in this situation, for these upward flows, uh, then we do know that mirror symmetry works uh, in the way that it should. <clears throat> but what can we say in general? Well, this is where I think I have a problem. So, so if we use, if we have a, a general upward flow, let's say, uh, this is a Lagrangian, then if we're going to have a hyperholomorphic bundle, then somehow the other complex structures must know about this Lagrangian, must know something about this Lagrangian. How, how is that going to happen? How in the character variety complex structure, how does it know about this, uh, this Lagrangian here? Well, one possibility is it might be this, this notion of conformal limits. So in fact, this, uh, there was a talk by Richard Wentworth a few years ago in Hamburg, which started off this uh, collaboration between Tomas and myself. So you might, so according to uh, this, uh, this uh, paper of Collier and Wentworth, uh, one of these uh, very stable upward flows has a conformal limit, which is a Lagrangian in complex structure J. And so complex structure J does know to a certain extent about this, on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the complex conjugate structure, there's an equivalent one which comes from the other side. And it's not clear that these uh, actually are giving you information which is uh, relevant for the, the hyperholomorphic uh, connection. So here, let me finish with this, uh, an example here of a Lagrangian subvariety, which is somehow what mazes, makes me raise the question or uh, air the, uh, my skepticality about whether uh, mirror symmetry is going to work in this way uh, for all Lagrangians. So here is a rather simple uh, example. Let's take a fixed point in rank two, uh, <clears throat> which uh, here is a nilpotent Higgs field, which looks like this. And now suppose this divisor P has a double zero at the point C. So and this is not this is not a very stable Higgs bundle. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens to the upward flow if it's not closed? What is its closure? So what you find is that the limit points uh, are actually on the uh, tautological section, on the on the Teichmuller space, if you like, from the from the uh, character variety point of view. It corresponds to quadratic differentials which vanish at the point C. So it's a, a hyper hyperplane in this uh, in this space. So those are the limit points. So this lies on the upward flow of this uh, canonical Higgs bundle. So here is an attempt at a, a picture of this. So this, uh, I guess, it's a helicoid. Uh, this is supposed to represent the upward flow U from this wobbly uh, fixed point. It intersects the nilpotent cone, so it includes this, uh, in fact, this projective line here. Uh, <clears throat> but it also intersects the, uh, the canonical section of the uh, integral system. So this is this blue plane here in something of co-dimension one. So if we look at the union then of u0 and u, then what we don't get a submanifold, we get something uh, to sub varieties, if you like, which intersect. So <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence to suggest that actually the mirror of this Lagrangian cycle is the universal uh, adjoint bundle for SO3 corresponding to the point C. So in the case when we had uh, two, if we had two distinct uh, zeros for this, uh, this A, then we will get the tensor product of um, universal bundles corresponding to those two points as the mirror. But here there's a coalescence and what, what I claim is that actually this, uh, this should be the, uh, the mirror of the uh, SO3 adjoint bundle. So then what does it leave for this? So suppose I just take the closure of U itself. This is some closed Lagrangian cycle. Maybe it's smooth. I, I'm not quite sure whether it's smooth or not. But, um, but is it possible that that should have a hyperholomorphic mirror? Because the, that SO3 connection is irreducible. 
yeah, this seems to be somehow part of it. So I think uh, <clears throat> the issue of uh, which Lagrangians do have genuine mirrors in the sense of this hyperholomorphic uh, Fourier Mukai transform, I think is very much open and is a subject which I think will reveal uh, more about the uh, geometric structure related to the hyperkähler metric of these Higgs bundle moduli spaces. So let me let me finish there. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, so I, I, I want to keep an eye on the time because uh, people are in uh, far-flung time zones, but um, if uh, uh, there is, uh, I, I guess we have time for uh, one or two quick questions, if anybody would like to ask something. You can just unmute yourself and speak up. Um, I have a question, actually. If, um... Sure, go ahead, Anne. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, Nigel. That was very nice. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about your last comment. You mentioned that um, what you seem to find in the on the dual side is some um, adjoint universal SO3 bundle. So does this have anything to do with um, these points being SU11 Higgs bundles, these fixed points that you were looking at? I don't think the real structure comes into it at this, at this point. Um, no, it's more to do with... Uh, questions of so the actual uh, the non-closed um, upward flow uh, meets the uh, fiber in uh, in two points and we have a third point for the uh, for the canonical section and there are other there are, I mean there are other calculations which uh, uh, which we've been doing which which I mean there are a number of different issues related to, related to this so um, uh, I, I don't think SU11 uh, appears in it. I mean, uh, you know, of course, mirrors of SU11, I mean, SU11 is going to give another Lagrangian, but I think we understand actually, uh, we understand actually the case of uh, UMM and its mirror much, uh, much better because they, uh, in the, that's one of the real forms which actually uh, uh, works well. So you go in, over into the uh, modernized space of the Langlands dual, which is, <clears throat> the symplectic, the symplectic. Uh, so I don't think uh, SU11 intervenes in this, this, uh, this uh, particular issue. Because there's also, um, I mean, there's this um, quasi split real form, and Langlands dual seems to be the Langlands dual of the Nadler group. So, yeah, anyways. Um, yeah, I no, know. I mean, sure, yeah, the whole issue about the Nadler group is a very interesting one. Uh, uh, but uh, this is an issue. I mean, this is just a rank two issue, and uh, it's you know we're trying to understand things in the simplest possible case. And if uh, if things are not quite the way they are expected in the simplest case, then you know uh, something needs to be uh, attended to. Thank you. Okay. Any more urgent Next questions? question, real quick? Sure. Oh, sorry, Mario was polite and raised his hand, I see. <laughs> yeah. uh, who are you deferring to? Uh, Mario, well, Garcia. Mario, Mario raised his hand. Go ahead, Mario. Oh, okay. oh. Go ahead, Mario. Yeah. Uh, hi. I was uh, wondering if there is uh, some studies in the, in the mirror symmetry literature about uh, a situation which is similar to the one that you are studying, but the uh, and not necessarily on a on a modular space. So say you have some hyperkähler manifold with some sister action. I study this uh, upward flow in some in some abstract set that which may give a hint on the interplay between this this uh, upward flow and, and mirror symmetry. I don't know if there is something already in the literature. Um, yeah, well, that's a, that's a that's a good question. I mean, there's. Um... There, I think there's a, a bit of work by uh, Ludmila Kamenova and Verbitsky uh, using uh, some actual compact uh, Lagrangian vibrations of hyperkähler manifolds, mm -hmm. uh, which um, which you know which are nice model. I mean, we don't have the C star action, but uh, they're nice models, and so there's a, a sense in which. Uh, yeah, they, 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 well, they could be an experimental 
uh, situation for, for understanding things where you have much more control perhaps over the sub varieties and, and so forth. Um, so that, yeah, that, that, that said, I mean, I don't know whether there's any published paper on this yet, but it, it's, it's conceivable, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the pure Calabi-Yau situation is, is, is quite complicated because we, know, we don't really have special, I mean, there are very few examples of special Lagrangian vibrations for the pure yeah. Calabi-Yau, yeah, but when we go to the hyper situation, then we have the holomorphic geometry to kind of help us. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, Brian, if you, if you don't mind, maybe let's save further questions till the end of the session, just so that we don't uh, slip in the program too much. Um, Cho, Cho are, are, are you ready to go? You're muted. Yes, I am, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, well then, if, if everybody's okay, I think we'll go um, straight into the next talk, um, which uh, is by Ngo Bao Cho, the other co-chair of this laboratory. Um, so, uh, as I'm sure you all know, Professor Ngo's Fields Medal winning work on the fundamental lemma was not only hugely important for the Langlands program, but also opened up vast new frontiers closer to geometry and gauge theory. And I think that's very well illustrated in the title of his talk, Kitchen Type Moduli Space in Automorphic Forms. And so it's a great honor to introduce Joe, who's going to give the next talk. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your introduction. Uh, let me say first to thank you, Oscar, for inviting me to this meeting. And uh, it's a great honor for me to have my name attached to the name of Professor Hitchin which first has influenced me a great deal. So I, um, so this, let me start sharing screen, hopefully mm -hmm. it will work. Okay. All right. So this is the, um, the plan of my talk. So um, uh, the, uh, the first part I just review um, uh, uh, the Hitchin vibration construction from the point of view algebra stack. And then from there, I will try to do some rather straightforward generalizations uh, of the Hitchin vibrations. And I will end up some in how to relate on this story to um, why, I mean, from my point of view, to automorphic forms and, uh, you know, raise some questions. I mean, uh, at this point, it is thin and for a pretty vague, but I hope that um, um, I think this will be, uh, I mean, uh, with the time, it's become more precise and I think it will be important. Uh, so this is the, I just recalled this by another Nigel on the, on the have talk about, of course. So this is the, um, on X is smooth projective curve of a complex numbers. And so this um, Higgs bundle is going to be a vector bundle on X, equipped with what's called Higgs fins. That is a map from V to V tensor to canonical bundles, which is OX linear map. So roughly speaking, we want to, to study the space of stable Higgs bundle. I'm not going to define what it is stable Higgs bundles, but um, there's also stability to Higgs bundles, things similar to the one for vector bundles. And we have this you know, fabulous Hitchin map, which is rather simple. Uh, in this context, we just um, take in basically the characteristic polynomials of this, um, of this uh, twist endomorphisms. So um, we attach to um, uh, uh, Higgs bundles, uh, 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 a bunch of of, of symmetric symmetric uh, differential forms, the AI, the trace of uh, West I of phi. All right, so this is the, uh, the Europe. So it, it is quite, um, uh, let me to review the same constructions, but in uh, with, um, uh, so this, let me recall, this is very important point that has been um, uh, discovered by, by Professor Hitchin. Uh, first of all, the, there is some kind of homeomorphism between the space and the vector bundles. The uh, space vector bundle is inter integrable connections on X. The second point that H is a complete integrable system. And in particular, the third point, the genetic fibers of, of H uh, is, uh, you know, almost uh, a billion varieties. In particular, this is the, the pickup variety of the space, the so-called spectrum curve. Uh, so le let me now review uh, this story. A little part two and three from uh, um, 
from from the uh, from the perspective algebraic stack. So now we start with a general reductive group of a of a, a fin k, which can be pretty arbitrary fin, and so the uh, they have the Lie algebras, um, and because you have the on the Lie algebra you have the the GM action which act uh, whose uh, which action is co commute with um, the adjoint action, you can twist uh, G by any Lie bundle so anything. So um, I, I, I'm on X, I give myself L some Lie bundles, which correspond to the canonical bundle in the in the classical context. Uh, even from the automorphic, in the from from the point of automorphic form, it's better to allow any Lie bundles. Uh, so we gain something, but we also lose a lot of things. Um, so we have this. So after twisting, I have some 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 bundle of Lie algebra, so G L over G, just very light twisting by some Lie bundles. And um, and we consider this star. So they, you should have the action of G on on GL, the adjoint action, because G again G the adjoint action commute with the scalar actions. So we, you consider this algebraic star, so to speak. So we have G L over G over X. So this is algebraic star. Uh, what it is, you just can say that the section of X to the, the section what I draw in blue. It just the usual Higgs bundles, right? So a section from X to this stat is a pair of E phi, where E is the G bundle on X, and phi is the global section of the, of the adjoint vector bundle twist by, by the libel on M. So, so this is sort of not a theory of this basic definition of the, of the stat. So, um, uh, but this is very just a, a very convenient language to, 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 to work with. It's, there's not, nothing very deep in this. So the first point is that um, uh, this plug is locally a finite type, but you can um, you can cover it um, locally by some uh, um, some by 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 uh, by scheme of finite type by some smooth map. And um, so, but here I just try to to. Um, to stress clear that there's, we have some kind of two different objects, slightly different. From from the from from the stacky point of view, we have the moduli stack of Higgs bundles, which is real algebraic stack, and which is slightly different from um, uh, the moduli space of, of stable Higgs bundle, which is of algebraic varieties. So there is a way to you know go from the stack to the to the space. You can for for instance you can impose some stability conditions that give you some uh, inside your stack, some the limon for stack. And when you have the limon for stack, there's some the, uh, this construction due to um, Keen and Mori that give you some uh, moduli space. So that that is one of the way that is give, uh, going back uh, from, from the M to the underlying M. OK. So now. Um, the Hitchin vibrations uh, is uh, somehow um, derived from the this kind of, of sudden difference. I mean, not, not so sudden, but there's difference between the quotient stack and the GIT quotient. So the GIT quotient he, here is um, uh, is the um, is the usual one. So we have this A uh, G um, double bar by G. So by definition, this is the. Um, so maybe I, uh, by definition, it, this is just this thing. Oh, you know what I do? do so I don't want this. By definition, this is the um, uh, the spectrum of the ring of G invariant function on the Lie algebra, and it is very. Uh, so this is this can be defined um, for any of five varieties. Equipped with the group action, but it's you know, usually it's better to uh, to work with actual reductive groups uh, so that the theory have some kind of nice behavior. For example, this ring is finitely generated, and uh, um, the and it's use, very useful to uh, to know the uh, an, another description of this um, ring of invariant function due to the the Chevalet that in, when you restrict invariant function on the Lie algebra G. To the Kaplan algebra T, uh, then the the G invariant function restrict um, uh, 
choose that W invariant function on T, and that question is an isomorphism algebra. So there are two ways, there are two ways of describing describing this uh, invariant quotient, which is uh, uh, it's actually very important uh, later on. For example, to um, to prove the, to establish in full general the dualities the, in the the mirror dualities in the itching vibrations. So all right. So anyway, we have this this map. So here the G mod G, which one a single bar, single um, single stroke is the algebraic stack algebraic stack quotient, and the one with two two stroke is uh, denoting the GIT quotient, and we, uh, the quotient stack map into the GIT quotient. So when we have this. I mean, on this is, of course, is um, equivalent with respect to the um, GM action. Then you can twist everything by a Leibandon, L. So I have this um, twisting. So now I have object map, uh, you know, uh, fiber over the curve X and um, locally isomorphic to the G mod G with the, uh, and globally, the, you have this one cos cycle given by the by the lie abundance. Now this language is kind of tautological to define the Hitchin vibration. So you have a, a section of X into a stack quotient. So denoted by the left, uh, the, the left blue row, E phi. Then I can compose with the map from the from the stack quotient to the GIT quotient. And that gives me a map from X to, to this AM, which is no longer a stack, it's a space. So it's, here's just a vector abundance. So um, I have this map, uh, the Hitchin map H uh, from M to A, where M is algebraic stack of, uh, of section of G L mod G, and whereas the script A is the space of section of A L, which is a vector bundle. So the so the script A is vector space. So that is the space when you when you write uh, what it. What is the effect of the of the L twist on the on the Chevrolet base? Then you can get to L plus L square plus etc. plus L to the n, and that that gives rise to the the user vector space that we have seen. So this is the uh, the stuck version of the of the uh, of the Hitchin vibrations. So they, I just want to add one single point. I don't want to. I don't want to go to the on these abstract nonsense things. But there's a very nice way to um, uh, to um, to give a group theoretic conversion of the of the spectral curve. Anyway, as we all know, the spectral curve works. is is really nice. I mean, this um, kind of perfect description of GN land. You can use spectrum curve for you can have spectrum curve for sim for symplectic group orthogonal groups. When you start looking at you know but with G two or exceptional groups, and that become you know increasingly messy. Um, but there's a version. It is, I think, it's weaker than the the spectrum curve, but it just works universally. That work on the, um, the uh, regular centralizer. So that is, I, on this page, I discussed this you know, the difference between spectrum curve and regular centralizer. So um, we see, you know, that the um, there there is this map from uh, from G to from G to the um, to the invariant quotient, and uh, in this context, constant has defined a section, a beautiful section. But in this um, language, you know, it, it is uh, somehow it is just it would go, but it's just nicer to see this here section from the from the GIT quotient to the to the stack quotient, and um, with many properties. But I think the the most um, somehow what makes the whole thing works is that is that the the quotient is smooth. So I mean it's. it's you, you you may ask how the system can be smooth. The system is never smooth, but because you be stuck, it is smooth. That means you can section and you come and you you know saturate reduction of G, then it becomes a smooth map. So instead of saturating reduction of G, I just caution it out. So I'm saying that the, this I have a section from the GIT caution to a stuck caution, which is a smooth map. Uh, and here it is. So there is a one kind of 
annoying technical point, but usually you can you can you can um, you usually can um, uh, sort out in, in a Skype cheap way. Um, the the course and session is not GM equivalent. That is one of the troubles, but it's kind of become you can you can make it equivalent after taking some Skype square root. So as long as you have a square root of L of the live bundle, and if that is the case for the canonical bundle, for example, uh, then you can uh, you can you can you can make it compatible with the end tools. So that you have this picture, we have these pictures. Uh, you have the 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 caution start of GL mod G. So this is again the G mod G twisted by L. You have AL, which is the which is GIT quotient twist by L. Then we have the and you have the map from the stack quotient to the GIT quotient. But now you have an addition the map from from A from the GIT quotient to GL G for, G, for to the stack quotient, which is provided by by cost basic by constant. Um, and I think in teaching papers he construct a slightly different for section, but it is um, some many equivalent. And the mere fact that the have a section that means that this map had to factor through some the regular part of G, uh, where the action is the the orbit has maximum dimensions and the centralizer you have to a regular set where the centralizer is a smooth scheme, and you can put it back to to A. And so for every section A, so uh, so in the in the space clip A for every point of the hitching base, so that gives you a map from X to A L. And compose it to the stack portion. When you pull back the centralizer, it gives you some smooth group scheme over the curve. And um, for uh, for when the point A is generic, you can prove that the uh, um, H minus the hitching fibers over A is isomorphic to the space of um, of J A bundles, they're not P A. So in general, what you have is the uh, the action. So P A is always a group. A P A acts on M A for any A. It is some universal, but when the for generic point, this action is simply transitive in in very strong sense in the stack sense. So this all I you know. Uh, 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 so now let me um, say some word about what do you win, what do you lose when you move from the the you know from modular space point of view to modular stack point of view. Uh, so for when you you no longer. Uh, Require L to be canonical bundle, then you lose connection with the moduli space of, of connections. So I think there's then, there's not much you can do about that. <clears throat> uh, but now on, on a stack point of view, can this can perfectly work over um, over a finite fins. So it makes sense over any fin. In particular, makes sense over FQ. And usually you can do the exercise of counting FQ point on the moduli stack on the on moduli stack which moduli stack, as well as um, counting point on the, on the hitching fibers. And uh, actually, I mean, when you ask this right question, it, it become almost tautological. In the, that you see that the, when you count the uh, FQ point on the whole stack, what you get is exactly uh, what in automorphic uh, theory they call the trace formula for Lie algebra. When the when the, the trace formula is um, is basically distributions uh, on the space of uh, you know spoon mousse and compact support function on the on the adelic point of the Lie algebras, and um, there's some kind of linear function on that. And uh, when you apply it. To some specific function, which is uh, which is given by the by the live bundle, then uh, that gives you, at least theoretically, the number of points of the of the whole moduli stack of hitching bundles. Of course, the whole, the whole thing is divergent, but I mean, uh, somehow you, you don't. Uh, it, at, at this point, you can we can use this as some kind of um, heuristic. Another thing is why we really need to use you know online bundles because it's really a distribution, so some kind of um, a linear function on on the on the gigant, gigantic space of functions. So we need to to use as many functions as possible. So in particular, when you look at some kind of fire function, you really need to uh, to uh, to deal with online bundle, not just a canonical bundle.
and you know everything you know, works better when, for example, for big really error is really large. I mean, greater than two G minus two G two. But in equal to two G two G minus two is also works, but you have more troubles. So and uh, also the uh, um, when you count the FQ point on not on the whole stack, but now on uh, on some heated fibers, and that that gives you really the structures of the of the of the trace formula and some kind of integrals, uh, in integral on some uh, conjugacy class and uh, more um, more specifically on some some rational stable and conjugacy class. I really don't want to go into this, um, you know, automorphic and harmonic analysis um, sub subtleties. So let's just say that it, there is kind of perfect, the perfect you know, dictionary uh, when you're counting FQ point on the Ricci modulized stack as well as um, uh, fibers, Ricci fibers to the trace formula. And moreover, when you count it from the fibers, uh, for some, um, uh, for the of, of course, for the for the regular fibers, it is very um, uh, the, then the um, the formula is simple, uh, but it even for the fibers uh, corresponding so to to some irreducible spectrum curve, and it have some very interesting you know over integrals that is what very interesting in incoming analysis, and and the formula is really convergent, it really makes sense. So when you're not looking at the um, counting point on the on the modular stack, but rather by fiber by fiber wise, and maybe you add on fiber together at the end, then you have uh, this question makes sense. So um, when you work over over a finite fin, it is uh, instead of counting points, much better to um, uh, to study this uh, this thing, this uh, direct image. So you just look at the derived direct image at the constant shift, erratic constant shift. And be, be, because how the way these things is set up, the modular stack is smooth and the kitchen map is proper, at least in some, some range. And this, this is a, a pure complex. And this, uh, this kind of, it seems to be very qualitative properties, but it uh, did have a, a huge, um, huge quantitative uh, consequences. Especially if you if you can uh, if you understand complete the composition. So a pure complex is by the uh, bellinson bergstein delin theorem is always isomorphic to um, a direct sum of C point perverse shift, uh, maybe with shift. And uh, at this point, to understand um, you know from from this perspective, the most in, um, the most important thing to understand is the, the decomposition of, of this. Um, of the direct image of the constant shift in the Hitchin map. And when you understand it, you know, the uh, you can prove the fundamental lemma, which was a very different conjectures in uh, Langland theory. Uh, okay, so here I, I, I want to to also to mention this amazing work of Goshenik, Wiss, and Ziegler, uh, which study the same object, Hitchin vibration on characteristic P. Uh, but uh, uh, using the same formalism that I set up, but at some point they they use a completely different ideas. So when I uh, um, when I study I was studying this, um, I thought it was the the right object to study is the modular stack, because when you count point you get right to the choice formula for Lie algebras uh, that we. Uh, uh, that is that that I mean people in automorphic form are interested in, and uh, cutting point on modulized on the modulized space right look extremely messy. So it seems to be a very bad idea to do that, and that's exactly what they do. What they did so they should and cutting point on do some in some periodic integration uh, on the modulized space, and they get into the very complicated formula. So it. That is involved more than just the group G, but uh, but many other group, what they call coendoscopic, which is kind of not the, the object that appear naturally in automorphic form, but appear very natural from the from the mirror symmetry point of view, um, uh, in deriving from from uh, from Hausen and Tadas work, 
and 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 they here they they use uh, really in 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 the full power of the duality phenomenon that uh, Hitchin vibration for G and G do one uh, uh, and and G and and with the lamb lamb do one of G uh, uh, a mirror. Not you know not only that the you know the abelian scheme that appears on genetic fibers are do on abelian varieties, but also on the uh, the isotropy group at one side become the duon of the of the connected component group, the pi on the other side, and vice versa. And that is you know from from this very very um, basic fact that we have a duon abelian scheme, and also with the um, the pi naught and the isotropy group are exchanged, which was I think it was pointed out earlier by um, in uh, in Franken and Witten work. Uh, they apply the periodic integration uh, formalisms, and they just give some 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 equality of integrals um, on the moduli space because of course you can do you cannot integration theory is really about some set right some some set theoretic cons. Uh, uh, set theoretical theory. Uh, there's no way you can do integration over a stack. But so, but the, what is amazing that when you try to write out what what this equality of integral means, and then they uh, they on the structure of coendoscopic group appears naturally, and they give you not just a, a new proof, but I think that's a very interesting new way to look at um, endoscopy theory. That is the, that I really, I really like this this work very much. So let me move on in some uh, 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 what I mean by general hitching vibration. So as I, I present it, you see the um, there's nothing special about um, about uh, about adjoint action uh, on G on this Lie algebra. Actually, the um, there's very nice papers, old paper by Luna Richardson. Um, who, who generalized um, the Chevalier Russian theory in mean, a kind of really amazingly uh, general setting. So they consider basically any, so, well, they have to assume the characteristic K is zero, which is kind of unfortunate for me who, who, who work many characteristic P, but I, I think that this, this assumption can be removed in many situations. <clears throat> so we start with uh, M, uh, some irreducible normal and five varieties, which acted on by some reductive groups. And then you can, of course, consider M, uh, the GIT quotient, M or G, which I did not A. And uh, using the Luna's Lie theorem, that is where they really use characteristic zero. Uh, they, uh, they prove that there's actually open uh, non empty open subset U of A, so that the fibers of the map from M to A. Right, this map, um, the fibers of M two A are over this open subset are, are on the same type. They are on of the homogeneous space of G mod H. Uh, when H is a subgroup which is well determined up to conjugation, right? And then um, they pick this H and they look at the fixed point of H. Uh, so instead of the Lie algebra of, of, of T, they look at the fixed point of H, and they prove this. They prove that the uh, the Vi group, which is the non-normalized of H divided by H, is um, you have can describe this um, isomorphism in absolute generality. So I quite amazing. And of course, you can do this the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, construction hitching in this context. Of course, you have to do some assumption. For example, if you want if you want to do something non-trivial, you better to have some have possibility to twist. So I assume have some kind of GM action on M, commuting on of G. So of course, if M is a vector space, then you have kind of um, scalar action, but you don't need to have. There's usually there's many uh, many uh, varieties with GM action commuting with G. We don't need to assume that M is a vector space, and so you can twist the whole thing with some any lie bundles. You can restart the whole construction in just the same way, and then we have new. Um, a new uh, hitching, uh, hit, hitching type uh, vibrations, um, and also the the, the structures, you know, kind of uh, complete integral system can survive um, 
So if you, again, if you assume like, like the kind of smooth section from the GIT quotient to the, to the stack quotient, then you have a regular centralizer. Uh, and then you can have kind of have some kind of description of, uh, of the fibers. They're very similar to Hitchin fibration. Of course, it works best when the journey fiber is kind of torus. When the journey fiber is, is torus, then the, um, the journey fiber of this map is in a billion varieties. And uh, I mean, all this need to be, um, has to be worked out in full detail, but I, I, don't, I, I don't see any, any kind of difficulties um, in this. So let me review uh, some examples. There's, there's kind of, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the, um, the lunar recharging papers, there's kind of a, a list of many examples that I actually don't know, but uh, there's some, I just list some examples that's kind of more familiar to me. So first, you have thought you have the option of G acting on the Lee and Jabras by adjoint action, and that gives rise to the usual heat vibration. And also, we have the uh, kind of familiar situation when they have group G equipped in evolutions, and you take K, the fixed the connected component of the fixed point, and you decompose G to using K plus P, where P is a minus one eigenspace, and then you can consider the action of K on P. And this is the GIT, the, the invariant theory here has been studied in great detail by Costa and Rallis. And this is, that gives rise to the uh, HG vibration for real and groups that I, uh, I think that maybe Oscar will mention in his talk. But also there's another object which is very, very, um, very, very close to the, um, to the usual HG vibration. In this one, so instead of the, instead of the of the Lie algebra, you look at the reductive monoid. So like a GN land, the space of matrices can be seen in two ways. Either it is the Lie algebra of, of GN land, but it can also see it as a reductive monoid containing G, right? So, so G act on M by left and right translation, and M had to be a, a phi and not one varieties. So this object is, has been completely classified by, by people like Renner and Winberg. And so G act on both on, on the left and right, but you can look at also the conjugation action. And now if you, uh, then you can uh, do the GIT, um, describe the GIT quotient. And also the monoid test, also always um, some GM action on this. I mean, if you have um, this kind of force theory on it, any monoid, you, you should have to have a GM. There is no monoid um, that containing the some kind of semi-simple group as an open subset. You need to have some kind of GM. And so uh, with this, actually, you give, uh, that's give rise to multiple hitching vibrations. So it actually, this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this fabric is, it looks very similar, but it's way, way more complicated than the, the additive hitching vibrations. So, you know, this is, uh, so why, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very especially interested in this example because this gives rise to the, to the bona fide trace formula. So the, 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 trace, the, the trace formula for Lie and Jebras is already become kind of very simple, wash, uh, washed down version of the, of the trace formula, the full trace formula. And this example, this construction with the reductive monoid gives exactly the, the full trace formula. And uh, for example, the um, uh, one of my students is working on this um, uh, on this uh, Hitchin vibration and, and 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 try to have to describe the complete decomposition theory um, the composition theorem for the Hitchin map in this situation and and um, uh, although he has not finished, but I, the the reason I mean the expected reason look really very exciting. Uh, so. Let me mention some kind of non-example. It's more like almost examples. So when you look at the M now, the uh, this is much more complicated examples. We have look at the commuting scheme. So x1, xd is the Lie algebra uh, satisfy the commuting relation, and you have G act on M by diagonal adjoint actions, and uh, and here I conjecture that the here, the, you don't know what is the, the invariant quotient, 
because the, you cannot apply lunar recharge. Uh, in lunar recharge, they have to assume the M is um, is uh, irreducible and reduce normal varieties. And here M is, is neither normal, it's not reduced, it's not irreducible, it's reducible. So we cannot do that. But uh, but the the you know the conclusion of lunar return should work. Uh, so this um, uh, with Chen and uh, we have verified it for GLN or SP2N. They're not very far from the orthogonal group, but it's become very this, this, the proof become increasingly complicated. You know, at least we get stuck at some technical point. I don't think it's very serious, but but I I found it kind of discouragingly complicated. But the, we, of course, we do not have a, a kind of uniform approach. Uh, it's very strange. They look very kind of theoretic. Should approach with you no know, root and. Uh, roots and weight and, and stuff like this, but the but the proof here is do not you cannot work with 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 any kind of I mean I don't see how can you this kind of uh, you know usual least theoretic approach, but which have to do some increasingly complicated linear algebra. Um, uh, but it, I mean it, it works beautifully for GNLN and SP two A, and we are kind of struggling for orthogonal groups, but. So I, I made a conjecture because uh, I mean, I, as long as far as I, as I can, can see, I don't see anything that can prevent it from being as a morphism. But you know, who knows for what happened for even orthogonal group, for example. Okay, so let me just say that this uh, uh, this example is very interesting because the, uh, when M is uh, when it. Um, uh, here we have an adduction of GND on this by, by doing linear combination of this vector X1, XD, commuting with the, the diamond adduction of G. And using that, we can construct the Hitchin 5, you know, it's not real, you know, giving a, you know, construct, it was only constructed by, by Carlos Simpson, but it gave the, uh, some kind of stuck key um, uh, interpretation of the, of the, uh, of the Hitchin vibrations for higher dimension varieties. And maybe he gives some tune to understand it, but it's somehow, I mean, even for the first, um, we have some difficulty to even understand the first step, what is the GIT quotient is not, it's not sought out yet. But I, uh, but I think this, um, understand the geometry of the HG vibration for higher dimension varieties, I think is really a quite a very fascinating problem. So let me finish to some say some word about the um, the, the automorphic perspective. So here we have this uh, in on this example, right? Uh, we have this orbit on psi, we have this map from M to A, some kind of Hitchin type uh, morphism, and uh, the the fibers can be expressed by some some kind of orbital integrons. You know, have this G acting on M, so every type of action can be orbital integrons, and. Uh, and from the, you know, when translated into um, erratic shift, what you really want is to decompose this map, uh, this direct, this derived direct image to direct sum of simple perfect shift and to understand this simple perfect shift. And for the adjoint case, you have some kind of uh, a complete answer. I mean, the kind of almost complete answer. Uh, it's not the case for other, for other case. But we, we kind of uh, you know know what are the support you know have some kind of have very limited list of the of the possible support of this perverse shift and uh, but to say you know yes or no this this thing appears is still a very difficult problems and I think this but this this is um, had to do with uh, uh, how we analysis of the open ones so but there's another side of the story. Uh, that is have another map from M to band G because you have a G bandon with additional structure. So if you forget additional structure, you have map from M to band G. And then you can also push forward the constant shift to the direction. So this map is, is not as good, it's not proper. It's, it can be, uh, the, you know, the complex is not pure, it's some kind of, kind of, it's kind of awful object. But nevertheless, um, this is, um, this map Q is actually a finite type, and um, uh, it is very uh, legible question to um, how you know. Uh, and if you count point here, 
you know, in in case for its finite fin, when you can do some count point, what you get is exactly what the uh, you know to morphic form the polyhedra theta series. So we have uh, if you want to count in point of M, it's becoming taken over band over band G of some theta series, which appears in in you know in many different degrees in in automorphic form. So the you know the theta series is typical way that we use to consult automorphic forms. Uh, but so uh, uh, so so now I mean from this perspective, you, what you really understand is the composing in some way is no longer a simple. Uh, it's no longer a pure sheaf. So the composition theorem is not working, but at least. I mean, as um, a function, as a mere function, it had to have a, 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 decom a no spectrum decomposition as um, some kind of direct sum or direct integral of eigen eigen automorphic forms or eigen sheaves. So, so now we have so the trace formula some kind of equated the spectral side and to the operator side because it, after all, this kind of uh, just cohomology of M, right? It can be expressed in two different ways. Uh, so um, uh, so now you know the uh, one of the problem is uh, um, very vague is uh, how to um, you know in Netherlands program one of the, the the main patterns is you know you, you want to want the, the big the, you know the big tool is how to compare one trace formula to another trace formula based on um, Langlands from Toretti conjecture. So Langlands have from Toretti conjectures give you somehow a connection between the, the automorphic spectrum from one group to another group. And then there's some kind of relation between the trace formulas and this kind of identities. Um, so the point is that this, uh, for the endoscopic case, it looks technical, but endoscopic case, the identity that it going to prove is very neat. It's one integral to another integral. So in the case of on hitching vibration, just decompose uh, direct image into some pieces, and you can equate this piece here with another piece there. It it really very neat and there's no fuzziness. And in general situation, beyond endoscopy, um, it uh, it actually even you know that this thing exists, but it's hard to uh, to formulate some 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 precise conjectures. But at least I believe that uh, um, it's, uh, it's very important to understand the full decomposition of the of the, the image of Hitchin map in, in generalities. And that may give some ideas about uh, children of problem. Another point is this, uh, also this is more precise problem that uh, uh, in, the, in the classical Hitchin vibration, you have this um, Langlands dualities uh, in use in, gener in, in generality to, to to Donaghy and Pantef um, over complex numbers and to Chen and Zhu over, over finite fins. Um, uh, and here, I mean, in many situations, you also have some kind of billion vibrations as long as the, the group action on M has the, the, the journey centralized is a torus, it, uh, the, it's under some conditions, uh, you have some kind of billion vibrations. So, how do you construct some kind of dual and abelian vibrations? So, as I uh, as the the uh, the, the work of uh, of Grosnick, Wiest, and Ziegler show the uh, the dualities really say a good deal about how um, the endoscopic works and uh, maybe uh, furthermore. So that is everything I have I have to say today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we can take a question or two if um, anybody would like to just unmute yourself or, oh, let's say Ron, Ron Donaghy, you have your hand up. Ron, can you yeah. unmute yourself? Uh, beautiful talk, thank you very much. Um, I had a quick question about the commuting variety. I thought there were some old examples, maybe I, I think I saw them in a paper of Witten from the 90s. For for SO eight, I think there are examples of triples of that commute that cannot be simultaneously lifted to the diagonal. Yes. So that that is. Oh. 
Yes, so the it 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 is true that for for when in, you know where three commuting metrics for some some higher rank, and then the what you say say that the the commuting variety is, is reducible, but nevertheless the GIT quotient is is irreducible because it you know it contracts into the. You know, it's not, it's not a contradiction. It can happen that uh, your variety is, is reducible, but the GIT quotient is still irreducible. In other words, you know, the, the other component doesn't have a close orbit. See, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> Just looking at, I can't see everybody on my screen at once, but uh, uh, Tomas, un unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. I wanted to ask if uh, these uh, orbital integrals or these quantities, the count of points on the fibers of your maps. I mean, do you ever have formulae for them? So can you compute them explicitly? I mean, no. I mean, maybe uh, we never have explicit formula. You can write as integrals, and in, in you know, it usually depends on the, some discriminant, right? You have some kind of discriminant. When for low discriminant, you can kind of compute it, but. Um, so it depends, you know, what the M on the head some kind of discriminant divisor in the kind of more quite general situation. And if we are section A from the curve to, to the space M, you're going to uh, meet with your discriminant divisors so some uh, some divisors, and it depends on the multiplicity of intersection. When the multiplicity is small, then and I think you can compute it. You can, you know, basically can figure out what is number of points, but uh, uh, otherwise you cannot, you, you can write a formula, but it doesn't give any explicit information. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, Oscar, are you ready to go? Um, Let me, yeah. I'm well, let, let's uh, let's take one minute break. We'll so just so we start on a, a round number time. So we'll start on ten minutes to the hour, whatever the hour is in your time zone. So that's uh, okay. In one in one minute. So if anybody wants to fill up their coffee cup, you've got uh, you've and got a minute. We can also thank again the skip the skipper. The, thank the you. Speaker. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> okay. Ah. Okay, every everybody's coffee cup full. Okay, um, so uh, so our final talk is uh, by Oscar, the coordinator, uh, not only of this laboratory but of its uh, two predecessors, and uh, through these and the really countless other activities that he's organised, and also through his uh, research on almost every conceivable aspect of Higgs bundles for real groups, um, Oscar's long been a pivotal member of our community. So it's a special pleasure to introduce him uh, and his talk on Higgs bundles and real forms. Okay, Oscar, over to you. Thank you, Steve. Well, I want to thank the uh, two co-chairs of, of the lab for the wonderful talks. And I have to say that I was very uh, happily preparing this event uh, where I was planning uh, two talks um, uh, by the chairs, uh, while uh, Nigel uh, suddenly suggested that I should also be speaking, and in particular on uh, the relation with real forms. 
So of course the wishes of the chairs of the lab are orders. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I accept it. And uh, so otherwise we would have a longer talks by the chairs, but okay. So, um, uh, so uh, I am considering a, a semi-simple complex group. We could easily have a reductive group, right? And, uh, and uh, then I want to consider a holomorphic involution of the group G and consider the, the fixed point subgroup uh, H, which is a reductive uh, subgroup. And then theta, this involution in the Lie algebra, when I'm, I'm using the same notation for the involution of the Lie algebra, um, defines a Cartan uh, decomposition in the, um, in the plus one eigenspace of theta and the minus one eigenspace. So with this in hand, so now we consider a compact human surface of genus say bigger than one. And I want to define uh, what is a G theta Higgs bundle. This is not a standard terminology, but I decided to use it in this talk. So a G theta Higgs bundle on X. And so this is a, a pair, E phi, uh, consisting of uh, a H bundle, an H principal bundle on, on the Riemann surface, uh, E, and then a holomorphic section of the bundle associated to the action of uh, the group H on M. This is by the, just the adjoint action. This is the isotropy uh, representation. M is the isotropy uh, representation. And so we have this associated vector bundle that we twist with the canonical uh, line bundle of X. And so the Higgs field is a section of that. So there are stability criteria that I won't be talking about and uh, familiar to uh, many of you. And uh, with uh, those uh, notions, we can construct the moduli space, say of polystable D theta Higgs bundles and that I would denote by N D theta. And, um, and so the, the first remark that I want to make is that the familiar uh, G Higgs bundles that we all know and love that were originally introduced by Hitching are actually uh, a particular case of this situation since uh, we can uh, regard uh, G actually as the fixed points of an involution of the product of G by itself, this involution here, big theta. And so, and the isotropy representation for this situation is actually the Lie algebra itself. So uh, G cross G theta Higgs bundle in this, in, uh, pair of a group and involution is nothing but just the usual G Higgs bundles. So, um, so just to illustrate that uh, by considering this uh, situation, this pair, we are generalizing the notion of the Higgs bundle. This happens very often in, in the theory and uh, so that uh, whenever one is dealing with the uh, joint action, that there is this involutive situation that actually uh, generalizes the um, the uh, the usual one, and so yeah, uh, we may need to sometimes to use this uh, uh, moduli space, and I will just note it by mg. So now uh, real forms. So let me just say that a real form of a complex group is simply the fixed point subgroup of an uh, uh, anti-holomorphic involution uh, sigma, right? And um, and so. Uh, uh, Cartan uh, tells us that actually if you have a holomorphic involution, G theta as we had uh, before, then you can actually find a compact anti-holomorphic involution uh, that is an anti-holomorphic involution tau of the group uh, that defines a maximal compact subgroup of G that commutes with theta. And so then, you now can define this um, uh, anti-holomorphic involution sigma, uh, and uh, then uh, G sigma is a real form of G. So the important thing is that actually all real forms, in fact, arise in this way. So thinking of holomorphic involutions, or rather classes of holomorphic involutions, modulo uh, conjugation by automorphisms or inner automorphisms, is the same as thinking of anti-holomorphic involutions. And so in a sense, sometimes it's more familiar to consider the holomorphic uh, involutions. Now, let me talk about character varieties. So I consider uh, G sigma now be a real form 
I want to emphasize that the group G itself, uh, similar to what I said before, can be thought of as a real form of G cross G. So uh, whatever I am saying here also has to do with uh, studying uh, like representations as we are studying also in the group G. So, but, uh, so we consider a representation of the fundamental group of X in this real form. And uh, this is a homomorphism. And now we consider the set of all reductive uh, homomorphisms since we want to have a nice, a nice uh, moduli space. And in fact, that moduli space of representations of pi one of X in G sigma, sometimes we refer to it as a G sigma character variety is defined as the orbit space, uh, uh, this orbit space, the set of all homomorphisms, uh, reductive homomorphisms, uh, modular conjugation by G sigma. And this can be endowed, of course, with a, a, um, a structure of a variety and, and so on. And so here's the, the key, uh, the key um, uh, relation between uh, Higgs bundles and character varieties is given by the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. And uh, I'm very glad that we have had today uh, most of the actors of these uh, uh, non-abelian Hodge correspondence. And it simply says that if you have this uh, theta, this holomorphic involution, then you take sigma defined as above by considering this uh, compact uh, involution tau, then there is a homeomorphism between the character variety, Rg sigma, and the moduli space of G theta uh, Higgs bundles. And uh, so, th so there are a number of problems that uh, once uh, taking in particular in consideration this uh, correspondence and benefiting from it one would like to study and uh, have been studied to some extent, but uh, there are still a lot of work to do and this um, hopefully will be themes to study in this lab and uh, hopefully we'll make progress. <laughs> and, and so one is to study the topology of these moduli spaces, uh, in particular counting connected components. And uh, this is not fully done uh, for real forms, although a lot is known. And uh, also computing the cohomology, which is known for some, uh, mostly for SLNC or GLNC, but not so much for other groups, and the study of motivic classes, uh, et cetera. That's one problem. Another problem is the study of the Hitching vibration for G theta Higgs bundles. Um, uh, Cho has been referring to this uh, uh, generalization, the Gossen Rallis generalization of the Hitching map. And this indeed, uh, when you have these objects, you do have this uh, Hitching map and uh, using the Gossen Rallis uh, 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 sort of uh, Chevalet uh, reduction theorem. And this has been studied uh, to some extent. Uh, we, there are works with uh, uh, Ramanant and Anna Peon, and uh, some in some cases describing the the, the fibers in the quasi split case with a paper with Anna Peon. And also Laura Shaposnik has studied this from the point of view of uh, from the point of view of spectral curves and so on. A lot of work to be done still in in understanding this hitching vibration uh, for general uh, involutions. Now, another problem is, is, uh, is in relation to the mirror symmetry and Langlands duality and uh, the role that these moduli spaces uh, play. Nigel has mentioned uh, this a little bit. So there is very nice conjectures and, and problems to study there. And uh, another uh, thing is the, the existence, uh, the identification of a special topological components, connected components uh, of these moduli spaces that relate to higher type Miller theory. So today I'm going to focus, uh, each of these topics would be uh, definitely would deserve uh, certainly a talk or several talks, but I will focus on this one. And I will also say something in the, um, if I have time, on the multiplicative Hitchin system that uh, Cho has been mentioning in his talk. So those are the two things that I would like to discuss. And uh, so to uh, describe this special components, let me just um, uh, give you uh, 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 some um, hints on how you construct this uh, 
these are special components. And so uh, a, a way to do that is considering SL2 triples in the, in the Lie algebra G. And so this is a triple of elements that satisfy the bracket relations of SL2 here, right? And uh, where H is a semi-simple group and E and F are the important elements. And uh, they do generate a subalgebra uh, isomorphic to SL2 in, in G. So there are um, two, uh, I cannot give uh, details. I will give you a reference later on. There are two different decompositions of, uh, of G uh, that one can consider. One is an, uh, as an SL2 module. And uh, uh, so as a representation of this SL2 here, right? And another is at the um, um, eigenspace uh, decomposition under the action, the adjoint action of the semi-simple element H. So the eigenvalues are integer, are integers, and so we can consider that. And combining these two, uh, these two uh, decompositions in some way, one can define a uh, involution of G as a vector space of the Lie algebra G. As just a vector space involution, but then something happens, uh, something um, that we think is magical, that's why we call this SL2 triples uh, magical, uh, happens if this vector space involution is a Lie algebra involution. So we define an SL2 triple to be magical if that uh, uh, vector space involution is a Lie algebra involution. And as we have seen before, this means that we can, uh, by choosing a compact uh, real uh, form, I mean, I was explaining this previously in the case of the group, but you can do the same and uh, the Cartan story for Lie algebras. And so you can find, uh, given the theta linear uh, involution, you can find an antilinear involution tau that defines a compact real form. And so you do have sort of a canonical real form G sigma of this uh, Lie algebra G. And so I'm going to present uh, some results that uh, uh, in joint work with Steve Bradlow, Brian Collier, Peter Gotten, and Andre uh, Oliveira. And the first one is a classification of these uh, magical SL2 triples, or well, here is presented as what are the real groups uh, for which uh, the real forms for which these uh, magical SL2 triples can occur. And so uh, the possibilities are that the group is, uh, the real form is a split real form. This is a um, Hermitian uh, real form of tube type. So this simply means that the symmetric space defined by this real form is of Hermitian type and is of tube type. Uh, which means that the uh, as a bounded symmetric domain is actually isomorphic to a, to a tube uh, domain. So I won't get too much into that. And then the other uh, options there is that the group is locally isomorphic to SOPQ with P bigger than one. And then you have this uh, um, other possibility where uh, your group is locally isomorphic to these uh, real forms of E6, E7, E8, and F4, I'm using here Cartan Helgeson's uh, notation, but the, uh, the important thing is that these are real forms that are uh, quaternionic. That is the corresponding symmetric spaces are quaternion Kähler. So this list here actually coincides with the classifications, classification of groups real groups admitting a positivity structure are uh, given by Guichard and Binhart recently. And I will say, uh, I mean, this is already uh, five years ago, in fact, and, uh, and which I will, uh, I will come back to that uh, later. So let me tell you what is the main um, um, construction that you get uh, considering an SL2 uh, magical triple. So you consider this SL2 magical triple, this is defined in this involution theta that I mentioned, and then you have the corresponding real form, sigma. And so then um, assume actually that you can lift this uh, involution of the Lie algebra to the group, right? So, so we can construct there is a union of connected components that we denote as H G theta of the modular space of G theta Higgs bundles, right? So it's a union of components connected components of this that um, 
have the property that the Higgs bundles uh, there have nowhere vanishing phi. So from the point of view of representations uh, via the non-abelian Hodge correspondence, Hodge correspondence, these do not factor through the maximal complex group of G sigma. And here is actually a parameterization of this, uh, of this uh, union of components, this Hg theta. This um, union of components is isomorphic, in fact, to a modular space of Higgs bundles, but now uh, G theta, in fact, G prime theta prime Higgs bundles, but now the twisting is not by uh, the canonical line bundle, but this power of the canonical line bundle. And then you have this uh, holomorphic differentials here. And everything here, so uh, G prime theta prime, so G prime is a complex reductive group, in fact, it's a subgroup of H and theta prime, and all these integers here, mi, um, are actually determined by the SL2 triple. In fact, they only depend on the conjugacy class of the SL2 triple. So the parameterization of a given in this theorem two is given by a, a morphism that we have from this, um, yeah, from this space here to the moduli space of G theta Higgs bundles and that we call Cayley map. And uh, so the um, topological components of the image we call uh, Cayley components. And um, yeah, so um, there is a reason why we call this uh, Cayley uh, map or uh, uh, Cayley correspondence. And uh, this uh, map recovers the uh, Cayley correspondence that one has for Hermitian groups of tube type that was studied um, uh, in this generality for a general group in, um, uh, in collaboration with Ricard and uh, Rubio. And um, previous classical cases had been studied a long time ago in my work with Steve Bradlow and Peter Gotten and uh, Ignacio Mundet. And it also recovers, and so in this case, actually, uh, the name Cayley has a particular significance because it's kind of related to how you, when you have a symmetric space, Hermitian symmetric space of tube type, and how you realize the bounded, the bounded symmetric domain as a, as a, uh, as a tube domain is, is referred as a Cayley, as a Cayley map. And uh, in fact, in the simplest case, this is the familiar uh, Cayley map that we all know from the, um, from the uh, Poincaré disk to the upper half plane. And uh, so that was the original reason to call this uh, Cayley uh, correspondence in this Hermitian case. And uh, so uh, this construction recovers also the uh, special components that uh, and the Cayley correspondence that uh, was found for uh, uh, SOPQ in the collaboration with uh, Aparicio, Bradlow, Collier, uh, Gotten, and Oliveira. And uh, it does recover also the uh, Hitching construction in the case where uh, in the split case. And uh, so when this real form is split, and in that situation, this uh, Cayley partner group, as we call it, is actually R plus, and these integers are just the exponents of G. And so Psi, this map here, is uh, the Hitching section constructing, constructed by Hitching in his original paper in 1992, using the constant principle, SL2, which actually happens to be a magical SL2 triple. So in a sense uh, here, we are generalizing uh, Nigel's approach in the split case and uh, where he considered the principal, principal SL2 to these other magical SL2s. And already in his paper, uh, Nigel was considering this involution theta and observed that in that case, it was a Lie algebra involution. So we are generalizing that to this magical magical triples, magical SL2s. Um, so let me just uh, say uh, this 
is uh, related to the um, to um, a notion of positivity. And let me just say something first about the um, the um, condition of being a, a nos of representation. Right? There are two. Uh, pillars in the theory of Higgs bundles and character varieties. One pillar is the theory of Higgs bundles uh, uh, initiated by Hitching. And then another pillar is this notion of a nos of representation into, uh, introduced by Francois Laborie. And uh, so let me tell you about this. So you have a real form and this uh, notion involves uh, a choice of a parabolic subgroup of this real form. And now we consider the, um, the Gromov boundary of the fundamental group. This should be x here. Um, uh, at some point, I was actually, all this that I'm going to tell you does not depend on the complex structure of x, is actually really something on the fundamental group. So, but uh, so this, and sometimes I use s to refer to the underlying surface. So here I forgot to change this to, to X. And so we have the, the boundary at infinity, this gram of boundary, you can think of it as a boundary of the, of the Poincare disk is isomorphic to the circle. And then uh, if you have a representation of the fundamental group into this real form, you say that it is P and Nosov if there exists a continuous map, unique continuous map, boundary map that goes from the circle, from the Gromov boundary into this flag variety, du sigma mod p, satisfying certain properties that I am not going to get in, uh, into and uh, for lack of time. And um, you can look at uh, Francois's uh, wonderful uh, papers. And uh, so this map, there's some very interesting transversality and dynamical properties and geometric properties. And this map is uh, called the Pianosov boundary curve. And so, as I said, this uh, notion was introduced by, uh, by Laboury in 2006 and has all these wonderful, uh, interesting geometric and uh, dynamical properties. And uh, one important um, um, uh, property that a loss of representations have that somehow uh, relate uh, a loss of representations to Teichmuller space of the surface is that uh, the representations, a loss of representations are discrete and faithful. And so, and, and defined uh, open subsets, subsets of the moduli space of representations of the character variety. But uh, the set of anosal representations uh, generally is not uh, closed. And so in the special case of hitching representations, that is the case uh, we have this uh, split real forms and you have the hitching components. And also in these uh, maximal, what are refer as maximal representations intermission groups of tube type, this is maximal refers to this Toledo invariant of the representation being the maximal with respect to the milner wood uh, inequality. In this case, they do define uh, components uh, uh, so of uh, uh, this uh, uh, hitching and maximal components define connected components of a of representations. However, this is of, uh, um, uh, a fact that in uh, both situations here, uh, the representations in those components, in the hitching and maximal components, satisfy an additional positivity condition, and, uh, which uh, is a close condition. So in the case of hitching representations, this was proved by uh, Labry and then by Fock and Goncharov using different perspective. And for mass maximal representations, uh, this was proved by Berger, Yotzi, and Wienhardt. And uh, so these notions of positivity that appear in the, in the split case and in the Hermitian groups of tube type, the, the split uh, case actually uh, there is a, a positivity, a notion of positivity that had been introduced by Lustig um, in the 70s and 
And so these notions of positivity have been um, unified and generalized by Gishar and Winghardt. And, uh, and so uh, again, this uh, notion of positivity depends on a parabolic subgroup of a real group for real form. And I just, let me just very briefly say that uh, if you, so um, uh, basically having this positivity structure is somehow uh, having a notion of positively oriented transversal uh, triples in this flag variety. And so that involves the unipotent subgroup of the parabolic and the fact that you can identify a certain semigroup of this unipotent group and by studying actually the representation of the Levy factor of P into the Lie algebra of U. And so you can, you can um, at the end of the day, make sense of this uh, uh, notion of positively oriented transversal triples in the per, uh, pairwise transversal uh, transverse triples in this flag variety. So, so this is what uh, Gishar and Binhart, uh, so they classified these uh, uh, positivity structures to find out that uh, the uh, groups that admitted the real forms that admitted uh, could admit these positivity structures are not surprisingly from what I already said, the split uh, real groups, Hermitian groups of tube type, groups locally isomorphic to SOPQ with uh, P has to be actually bigger than one, and then this quaternionic real forms of F4, E6, E7, and E8 that I mentioned before. It is important to point out that actually um, uh, some of these groups um, do feature in, uh, in, uh, in various of these categories, like for example, the symplectic real group SP2NR is both, both a split real form, but it's also a, a Hermitian group of tube type. And uh, uh, it's important to realize that actually the, the, the choice, the, as I said, the notion of positivity involves a choice of a parabolic uh, subgroup. And in the case of a split is the Borel subgroup. While in the Hermitian case, is actually a, a, a parabolic subgroup so that this is this flag variety is in fact the shield of boundary, the shield of boundary of the corresponding symmetric domain. And so, so the point is that for a given group like SP2 and R, you can have two different positivity structures and uh, uh, corresponding to these two different choices of parabolic subgroups, Borel and the one uh, featuring in the uh, in the shield of boundary, uh, um, right? So, if you have a, a pair of a real group with a, a parabolic subgroup that admits a positive structure, then you can refine the notion of an Ossoff representation, P and Ossoff, right? So you have a P and Ossoff representation, and say that it is positive. If the Anosov boundary map, this uh, map here that we had, because this is Anosov discontinuous map, sends positively ordered triples in the circle to positively ordered triples in this flag variety. So you can do that because of the positivity structure. And so then you say that the Anosov representation is positive. And so um, the, uh, this uh, positive condition is an open condition. However, uh, so um, the, um, um, at the moment, it is a conjecture of Guichard, Labori, and Binhard that um, if you have this uh, uh, real group and a parabolic admitting a positive structure, then the set of positive P and also representations uh, is also closed in the character variety. And so uh, this is, as far as I know, is still a conjecture. And, and, and hence, uh, so if this conjecture is true, then it will define uh, a union, uh, the positive representations uh, will define a union of connected components, like 
it is the case in the case of heating components and for the split real forms and the maximal components for Hermitian groups of tube type. So um, there has been for a long while the term of higher tacular component. And in fact, Nigel already in his uh, paper on the Hitching components referred to this to generalize tacular spaces or uh, something like this. And it has been this term generally used um, even when we didn't know uh, there was something beyond the case of a split of components for the, uh, uh, the split real forms and the uh, Hermitian tube type uh, components. And, but uh, here is a definition that one now, a very precise definition of what a higher tech Miller component is. And so this is a connected component of the character variety consisting entirely of positive and not of representation. So in particular, they are discrete and faithful. And so in the uh, paper that I mentioned in, in uh, the work that I mentioned with uh, uh, Bradlow, Collier, uh, Gottend and uh, Oliveira, using our magical SL2 triples, we um, actually proved something uh, about these components that these uh, Cayley components that we constructed using the Cayley correspondence. By the way, I should say that in that general setup, now the name Cayley uh, had a, a, a special, an extra significance because in the general construction, we did actually use something else that is called as a, a Cayley, uh, Cayley map that relates um, uh, two types of SL2 triples. So definitely the name of Cayley was uh, <laughs> indeed the right one, even though at the beginning it was more or less an analogy. But um, so let me just say that in that um, construction of this Cayley components uh, using the magical SL2 triples. So uh, we show that uh, this uh, involution theta defined by the SL2 triple defines an injection of the tachymular space of the surface that uh, identified as actually a maximal component of the character variety for SL2R, yeah, tachymular space can be uh, of the surface can be identified as a component of the character variety for SL2R with maximal Toledo invariant or maximal Euler class. And so by using this, um, this magical SL2 triple, you have that you can embed this uh, Teichmuller uh, space or the corresponding Higgs bundles in this uh, union of connected components. And uh, so, uh, uh, so this image consists of positive representations. And because of the open, openness uh, property of positive representations, so we showed that uh, there is hence an open subset of positive representations in this in this um, union of connected components of the moduli space. So uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, the answer, a uh, positive answer, if it has to be positive, and uh, uh, to the guichard labori Wienhard conjecture. And actually, I would, I think this is one of the, uh, like to um, all these three people uh, are um, associate members of the lab. And I really encourage them to prove this conjecture and uh, hopefully before the duration, before the end of the lap. But, and so the, uh, the, uh, um, the higher tagular components co coincide with the Cayley, with the Cayley components. So here are some um, problems for uh, further study. And uh, uh, so, yes, let me just double check. Are you hearing me? Because I am a little bit, I don't see anybody here. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good, very good, very good. You have been so, so nicely silent that I was, <laughs> for some reason, I don't see you in the image, but great, great. So just not to get the feeling that I'm talking to myself, which is rather <laughs> silly. Uh, okay, so so here are some some uh, further study uh, problems that we want to address in uh, in the lab in relation to this to this um, Cayley components and higher tagular components. 
And so I already mentioned that it's important to study the topology of these moduli spaces. And in particular, we would like to study the topology of the higher tegmular components. Of course, in the case of the Hitching components, because these are really vector spaces, um, topologically, they rather uh, nothing much to say. But in the other cases, already in the maximal, in the maximal, uh, in the case of maximal representations, uh, we have there is work, ample work that shows that these are topologically non-trivial, and uh, so it is. Uh, uh, since we believe that these components are particularly relevant, uh, we would like to to understand the topology. And so far in the study of the topology, the point of view of looking at Higgs bundles has been particularly powerful, thanks already in the seminal uh, work of Nigel's in 1987, where he introduced Higgs bundles, thanks to the CSR action, as we have seen already in his talk today. And, uh, and so, um, and uh, uh, that one obtains by rescaling the, the Higgs field. And the nice thing about these components is that um, while uh, the general uh, uh, components of the moduli space of G theta Higgs bundles are generally singular, and this poses some difficulties, these particular ones, let me just say it in an informal way, they are less singular. And this is something that we also, um, I mean, a precise statement we make in, in our paper, the paper that I refer uh, before. So, if you are um, a Teichmuller theory person, of course, there is a, a, a lot of questions that you can ask that um, uh, in, for these higher Teichmuller spaces, and many of these have been asked. Some of them uh, have been partially answered or answered. And a particular important one is the existence of a complex structure on these higher Teichmuller components that is invariant under the action of the mapping plus group of the surface. Right? So there is some work on this in some cases. And so I encourage members of the lab and everyone that to actually uh, work on this very interesting and fa fascinating question. And uh, in general, I would say that um, we need to have a deeper understanding of the relation between positivity and the Cayley correspondence. Uh, to a large extent, this uh, point of view of Higgs bundles and the point of view of a NOS of positive representations, uh, they look like two different uh, ways of, like if we were seeing two different parts of the moon or something. And uh, uh, somehow, uh, I mean, we have seen already that this is start to, to, to talk to each other in that uh, finding a deeper relation, but there is, uh, uh, it's, it's still very mysterious. In particular, for example, the uh, correspondences that we have uh, show that there should be a, a correspondence between these boundary maps uh, that preserve positivity and this uh, twisted moduli space of Higgs bundles given by the Cayley correspondence. And so is rather um, uh, tantalizing to see, uh, can we find this connection directly or so, but let me say generally uh, a deeper understanding of this um, relation, these two points of view. Uh, that uh, So the Higgs bundle point of view seems to be particularly adapted to uh, study the topology and uh, other questions and so on, while there's a not so positive point of view says more about individual uh, representations and uh, et cetera. But, uh, and in the, uh, for example, something I haven't mentioned here, this uh, library conjecture, um, uh, uh, they, so people, there are some uh, people that have started to understand some connections. So I, I encourage, um, uh, I mean, I encourage, I would love to see more progress in that direction. There's also something with the, uh, I was going to say with the permission of Anna, Anna Winhardt, but I haven't asked her permission um, to uh, just, um, uh, she has been referring in some talks, recent talks about some non-commutative aspects of this higher type mirror components that uh, I find very uh, mysterious and uh, very intriguing uh, that have to do with the fact that uh, in particular, uh, classical Hermitian degroups of tube type 
can be realized as a uh, sp2 group uh, over a non commutative ring with an involution. And so Anna's, um, I don't know how to call it, dream or view is that in fact, the, there is a, a generalized sort of heating map that uh, taking into account this non commutative nature. And the this scaly components that we have found are really obtained as uh, sections of this uh, sections of of this uh, of uh, sections of of this Makichi map. So this would be wonderful uh, to see uh, there is more progress. So there are many other problems that one could suggest, but uh, I would like to now uh, sort of to move to um, I said I would say something about this multiplicative um, Higgs bundles. So when uh, we were discussing about this, um, uh, setting this uh, lab, uh, having discussions with Nigel and with Chao, uh, Chao mentioned uh, in some email, uh, mentioned the term multiplicative Hitchin system. And I was very puzzled because I didn't know uh, actually what he meant by that. So I, uh, this was last autumn, uh, and, uh, and so then I asked him, can we have a Skype meeting and uh, discuss about these multiplicative things? And so he explained to me this, and, uh, and so uh, then, um, so basically, uh, he has mentioned this in his talk today. I'm, I'm very pleased that he has actually talked about this. And uh, so in uh, this multiplicative version with the same notation as above, right? We considered pairs where it is a principal uh, G bundle. So this is, you know, if you think of G Higgs bundles, the usual G Higgs bundles that we, that we know. So E is a G bundle, right? So here is also a G bundle. And, and phi is a, is, a, is a holomorphic section, not of the adjoint bundle associated to the Lie algebra, uh, to the adjoint action of G on the Lie algebra, but actually to the uh, to the adjoint uh, in the adjoint group, and so uh, so um, so uh, phi is a meromorphic section, uh, and there is some singularity data that one fixes at the points of a certain divisor, and this singularity data have to do with um, fixing. Um, some orbits in the loop Grassmannian, which uh, are related to uh, some um, um, uh, dominant weights in the Langlands dual group. So I don't want to get into this, though there's no time. But so, so I, uh, so I didn't know anything about about this when I discussed with um, with uh, uh, Chao, and uh, but then I realized there were. Uh, um, several papers on this, in particular, uh, a very uh, nice paper by Jacques Rotevis and Jan Markmand uh, about 20 years, almost 20 years ago or something. And then uh, Cho and Frankel at Frankel. So they uh, also considered this in a paper in uh, 2010 uh, in relation to the trace formulas and so on. And so in, in my meeting with, uh, with Cho, I said, well, what about considering an involution? Right, because this is what we have been doing exactly in what I have described to you, the Higgs bundles that relate to uh, representations to real forms. And so I, uh, I was uh, very excited about this. And, uh, and so um, I, was, I, spent, I have spent the last few months uh, really rather uh, um, <laughs> excited uh, without really knowing where to go uh, precisely, but uh, this kind of objects where, uh, so we have G and we have an involution and now uh, in particular, so this is a particular situation of what uh, Cho was describing uh, before. And so phi is now a meromorphic section of the bundle. Uh, so E is an H bundle and H acts on this homogeneous space, right? So H is the fixed points of the involution in particular. And so there is uh, this singular data that I don't want to enter into. And um, so here's a claim. So I actually, uh, I needed some support. And so I asked my uh, student, uh, 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 Guillermo Gallego, and uh, that uh, to, to join me in working with uh, this, actually his name should go before mine. Um, and, uh, and so to justify, 
the uh, considering these objects, um, I was making a following test, which is that in the usual G Higgs bundles where the Higgs field takes values in the Lie algebra, it is well known that actually the mg theta, when you have an involution, these uh, uh, moduli spaces appear as fixed points of an involution in the moduli space. This was already um, studied by Nigel and other people, uh, Larry Shaposnik and Anna Peon. And uh, so then I uh, wrote a, a paper with uh, uh, Ramanan, uh, uh, sort of giving a full description of this story of uh, how these uh, moduli spaces appeared as fixed points of involutions in the moduli space. And so our test was, uh, our claim was, uh, and the claim is that to, to show that these previous objects do appear also, in fact, as fixed points of this involution here now. This is the multiplicative version of the involution that you have when you have the moduli space of usual uh, Higgs bundles, where here is uh, theta e and then minus theta phi. So uh, it's not surprised that it comes like this. And so there is indeed, uh, uh, as, as Cho has sh shown, there is a, a hitching map on the moduli space, I just denote you know, this moduli space of, this, uh, of these objects, there is a, an H bundle and the Higgs field takes values in, uh, in the G mod H by uh, this. And based on the uh, Luna uh, Richardson multiplicative version of the Chevalier restriction map that generalizes Gauss and Rallis, one, one does have indeed a, a hitching map, right? As very nicely uh, actually uh, Cho has illustrated in more generality. And so, so there are some problems that uh, uh, we uh, very much would like to study and uh, I and very much would like to study. I regard this particular problem as a very um, uh, nice, uh, outcome of this lab already because it emerged in these discussions with uh, Cho. And, uh, and so studying the fibers of this vibration and also uh, study the relation to the Nadler group that has been alluded previously. And so, so this um, situation that we have been considering here of an involution, uh, we have been actually thinking in a, uh, in a more general situation along uh, the lines of what Cha has been describing by considering actually uh, um, more general spaces here, in particular spherical varieties, spherical varieties for which um, Nutler and Gate uh, Gatesbury and Nutler have also shown the existence of a certain subgroup of, of the Langlands dual group of G, right? And uh, this has been also considered by Sakularides and Venkatesh. And uh, so understanding uh, this other general uh, situations, but in particular, this involutive situation, I think would be a, a very nice, is, is one of the, um, uh, goals of this lab and um, and so um, I'm very glad that uh, Cho already discussed this today so I think I'll, I'll um, I will stop here okay Th thanks very much so I guess the uh, the floor is now open uh, uh, specifically for questions or comments about the last talk, but also uh, uh, about anything that you've heard today. I think there's uh, a question Anna, by Anna. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. Hey, uh, nice talk. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I was wondering whether um, your magical triples um, clarify somehow why these higher Teichmuller components are actually related to geometric structures. So you have, you know, you have some geometric structures coming from the magical triples. Do you have anything else maybe in terms of Anna's program or whatever? I mean, do you know well, anything else? Well, first of all, I think one of the uh, immediate problems, which is really a problem in Lie theory, uh, nothing to do with Higgs bundles or representations, is understanding the a direct link between this magical SL2 triples and the uh, positivity of structures defined by uh, Bichard and Binhart. 
Uh, at the moment, this uh, is simply, we classify, uh, they classify uh, their positivity structures. We classify our SL2 magical triples and we do get the same things, right? So uh, in fact, um, in view of this, I hope that at some point we'll stop calling this uh, triples magical to call them perhaps positive triples, right? Uh, because I think that is a more uh, humble, um, uh, well, positive is also nice, uh, very ambitious, and uh, but magical can be, uh, you know, is ambiguous. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's one thing. Now, um, you could have asked the same question about how these positive uh, structures uh, do help to understand geometric structures, uh, right? Uh, uh, related to these representations in those higher technical components. There is some understanding, in fact, uh, Guichard and Winghardt, uh, uh, previous work also by, you know, in, in other cases like SL3R by uh, Bill Goldman and others. Uh, so um, the answer to your question, I don't know, but uh, it is uh, definitely, uh, uh, I think there is a lot still to understand about these geometric structures, because beyond the cases of, you know, a small rank, SL2, SL3, and you rank two or something, yes, rank two. Uh, you have to go to uh, outside of the surface to understand this, this uh, geometric structures. And uh, yeah, so hopefully this, this, all this machinery will be, uh, will be helpful to understand that. Yes, that is a nice goal to set for this lab. Thank you. Okay, um, anybody else got their hand up? I think there were questions for the previous speakers. Right. At least an intention. I think Brian had a question. Right, but now I have to remember it. Oh, um, <laughs> I was Sorry, just Brian. hoping that- uh, I didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> I was wondering if Pedro could expand on uh, his skepticism um, about this uh, holomorphic connection having to do with the fact that uh, this, you have this conformal limit coming from infinity and its relation to the, the conformal limit coming from say zero. And if you understood it all, the relation between those two objects. Okay, so I need to shut the door. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I um, I don't think there's a uh, I don't think it intervenes. Actually, I mean, it's tempting to think that uh, complex structure J knows about the, uh, the the Lagrangian because of this conformal limit. But as I understand it, uh, I mean, the conformal limit of the each section is a space of oppers, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So on the other hand, this is uh, this is a real form that we, I mean, we know, I mean, the the holomorphic bundle, the hyperholomorphic bundle for that is the trivial is generally recognized to be the trivial bundle. So uh, I, I don't see how somehow, even in that situation, somehow the the trivial or hyperholomorphic bundle on the, you know is associated with, with the space of opus. So I, I think, you know, it has to be something which, um, which goes kind of smoothly from one side to the other. So, so uh, uh, how should I put it? The, the conformal limits from both sides, from, you know, from the complex structure and its opposite complex structure, they will, uh, they will usually, I mean, they will rarely be the same, I assume. And, uh, and it's part of a, maybe it's part of the structure. I mean, I think <coughs> if you look at the, the kind of complexification of the, uh, the metric on the, if you look at the, the, the standard metric on the moduli space of stable bundles, then its complexification is somehow built up out of the, um, out of these, the way I see it out of perhaps these conformal limits of the 
uh, Lagrangians corresponding to the cotangent vectors. I mean, there's one from one side and one from the other side, these transverse pictures. I think there's something to be, to be seen there uh, by looking at these uh, conformal limits. But uh, uh, and at first sight, sight, I thought that this was probably the, the way to interact with the hyperholomorphic connection. But in, on second sight, I think perhaps not. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? I would like to ask one question, please. Um, I have a question for Professor Ngo. Uh, it's uh, regarding, regarding this commuting variety. Um, so I think you mentioned it. There is like this uh, uh, this morphism from the this quotient of a po power of the Cartan subalgebra by the Weil group to the uh, commuting variety to this commuting variety. So uh, I think you conjecture that that is an isomorphism and. Uh, I'm not sure what, what would be the implications of that being a nice morphism for Higgs, for studying spectral data of Higgs bundles. Or, I mean, would that give you like camera covers or something like that? Or well, I mean, um, it does give you some kind of camera cover. That what we study in our paper. For surfaces, um, uh, well, you know the, the thing is that this um, this give you first some camera cover, but the, the the map from t to the d to to the t to the d mod w is not flat. That is one of the the features when the case of higher dimension is the, the quotient of, of the power of a carton by the by after the you know dimensional value group is no longer flat. So you can form some kind of cover, but which is kind of it's not flat covers. So and then you have to do some, you know, if you try to describe fibers, then you um, uh, then you have to do something with that, you know, kind of flatification of that. Uh, so the so the the conjecture is not directly related to the description of the of the you know the of the rich in fibers in general. But I just find it very annoying that you cannot solve this kind of very basic problem of GIT to start with. And that instead of, you know, you can do some assumption to, to get rid of the problem, but I, you know, I just find it very deeply unpleasing. So I try to prove it, I mean, with Chen, so the, but I, I find it kind of very um, amazing that is, the, for example, for, for GNLN, you know, even for GNLN, uh, you know the the thing in this. You know, even in the case of, of the classic on K of of, of Coston with adjoint action, it's very easy to 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 have a map from T to G, and then the map from T mod W to G mod G, right? But there is not a it's not easy how to construct the, the opposite map. How to construct the map from G to T mod W, which you use all the time, but how to construct it canonically? It actually is not easy. <laughs> You know, you know, it is this morphism because you know that it's some kind of restriction, restriction, so the restriction theorem gives some kind of isomorphism. So you can inverse the map. But how can you construct just a map, you know, by some some kind of nice functorial way from G to T mod W? And it's, when you think about it, it's, it's actually not obvious. And um, it have just so happened that the, that the lean it, um, do this for, for GLN for you. Uh, for commuting varieties, and using that, the the, the lead map, it's kind of amazing construction. It's very it's very elementary algebra, and then you can prove it in a survey restriction theorem for for GNLN, and you can apply the kind of same strategy for symplectic group. It costs more. You can know, have dual study around Fafians uh, to go around, and um, but for orthogonal group, it just I have like a four different identity for Fafia that I, I can pull three of them and not the last one. So I, 
I kind of give up for, for now. But it's just very curious. I don't understand what the what is the, the underlying structures right now. It's just some kind of very interesting in exam, um, exercise of algebra that I, yeah, I love to solve. Uh, Peter Gotham, you have your hand up. Did you have a question? You're Sorry, muted, you're muted, yes. Uh, so, so thanks to all the speakers for very nice inspirational talks. And, and I, so I had a question for Oscar, probably a naive one, but anyway. So I was uh, very intrigued by these um, multiplicative Higgs bundles. So I was wondering, is there some gauge theoretic uh, interpretation of this that you might uh, get some kind of Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence maybe involving Lie group valued moment maps, something like this, I think it was trendy a few years back. I can see in one of the squares of the screen an expert on that. That's my friend Jacques. So this, this as I mentioned, uh, yeah, I was fascinated by this multiplicative uh, Hitching uh, Higgs bundles, and um, and I mentioned the works of Jacques and uh, Markman, and uh, where they actually relate this to monopoles and to uh, they. For some reason, there is very often they mostly make sense uh, uh, these uh, systems on elliptic curves, right? And but uh, not not exclusively. And uh, so there's a relation to to monopoles, and so uh, but in uh, but they also gauge uh, theoretic interpretation. I have some some other thing in mind, uh, perhaps another gauge theoretic interpretation, but I am not. Um, uh, so adventurous as to mention it here because I still have to do some some checks, right? But um, but yeah, I find this problem fascinating. In fact, uh, poor Jacques had to put up with my sending him messages about this at the time well, that he well, was. I, I was just uh, looking at my message and realized that I had sort of answered um, <laughs> un peu à côté uh, okay. on the side that, that uh, we, we were interested in the, the integrable systems that these things um, provide and looking for, you know, the Lagrangian vibration. Um, and in that case, it, it does seem to sort of be limited to genus zero and one. There are all sorts of ways of seeing it. And one of the sort of amusing one is that all of these systems, um, you know, birationally can be thought of as, as uh, parts of the Hilbert schemes of points on, on Poisson surfaces. And the appropriate Poisson surface for these multiplicative systems is C star vibration over a base as opposed to a C. And uh, the, the, uh, they only work for elliptic curves and rational curves, they don't, uh, doesn't work for the others. So that, that's one way of seeing it. But then of course, you know, that's, that's just getting your mind stuck in a, in a rut and not uh, saying, well, okay, we, maybe we don't want it to be symplectic. Uh, in which case, uh, you know, you, you can, I suppose. So, so I'll have to go back and, and relook at those emails and uh, make new penance. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe at the lab. I'm, I'm, I've got a sabbatical in a year, so you might, I might appear on oh. your doorstep. Oh, fantastic. Great. Great. So. You will get more messages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Has anybody else got their hand up? <clears throat> or any... Okay, well then... Uh... Maybe let's just uh, thank all the speakers again and uh, wish the lab uh, all the success. Uh, let, let, let's thank you all and then Oscar has something to say. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I just simply want to thank you again and um, to the chairs, to the chair of the session, Steve Bradlow, and to all of you. And to say that this is not a private club. So this, you know, if you go to the web page, you'll see that there are some members. But to be honest, I mean, we have to put a limit, but uh, but it's still open to membership. So uh, I just hope that the chair of the the chairman of the institute doesn't uh, doesn't throw me away for putting such a long list. But the fact is that this is open to everyone interested in these problems. And we really hope you, whether you're a member, an associate member or whatever, 
whoever you uh, will participate in our activities. And uh, we really hope that we will have physical activities soon. And, uh, and, and, and so um, I look forward to, to seeing you. So. Okay. Well, thank, thank you all. Um, I guess the uh, proceedings are now closed, but stick around to chat if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.